chair of the Health and Human Serv Services Committee. I'd like to invite the members of the committee to introduce, introduce themselves, starting on my right with Senator Day. Good afternoon, Senator Jen Day, represent Legislative District 49 in Serpy County. Hi, okay. Senator Brian Harden from District 48, Banner, Kimball, and Scottsbluff counties. I'm always forgetting to start when it's my turn. <laughs> I jumped the gun. Senator Michaela Cavanaugh, District 6, West Central Omaha, Douglas County. <clears throat> Murphy Legislative District 12, which is Southwest Omaha, and the good folks from Austin. Also assist, assisting the committee is our legal counsel, Benson Wallace, our committee clerk, Christina Campbell, and our pages for this afternoon is Ethan and Delaney. A few notes about our policy and procedures. Please turn off or silence your cell phones. We will be hearing four bills and we'll be taking them in the order listed on the agenda outside the room. On each of the tablets near the doors to the hearing room, you will find green testifier sheets. If you're planning to testify today, please fill one out and hand it to Christina when you come up to testify. This will help us keep an accurate record of the hearing. If you are not testifying at the microphone, but want to go on record as having a position on a bill being heard today, there are white sign sheets at each entrance where you may leave your name and other pertinent information. Also, I would note, if you are not testifying but have an online position comment to submit, the legislature's policy is that all comments for the record must be received by the committee by noon, the day prior to the hearing. Any handouts submitted by testifiers will also be included as part of the record as exhibits. We would ask that you, if you do have any handouts, that you please bring 10 copies and give them to the page. We use a light system for testifying. Each testifier will have five minutes to testify. When you begin, the light will turn green. When the light turns yellow, that means you have one minute left. When the light turns red, it is time to end your testimony and we will ask you to wrap up your final thoughts. When you come up to testify, please begin by stating your name clearly into the microphone and then spell both your first and last name. The hearing on each bill will begin with the introducer's opening statement, followed by the, the, the introducer stating that the Judiciary Committee is less than the HHS Committee. After the opening statement, then we will hear from supporters of the bill, then from those in opposition, followed by those speaking in a neutral capacity. The introducer of the bill will then be given the opportunity to make closing statements if they wish to do so. On a side note, the reading of testimony that is not your own is not allowed unless previously approved, and we do have a strict no prop policy in this committee. With that, we'll begin today's hearing with LB 794 and welcome Senator Wayne to open. Good afternoon, Chairman Hansen and members of the Health and Human Services. First, I must say, Vice Chair Harden, you run a way better hearing than Senator Hansen has ever ran. So Thank I you. Want, <laughs> I want to put that on the record that I really appreciate what you did last time for me. Second, my name is Justin Wayne, J-U-S-T-I-N-W-A-Y-N-E, and I represent Legislative District 13, which is North Omaha and Northeast Douglas County. LB 794 is simple. We've identified problems that we have, uh, nursing shortages in Nebraska, a workforce issue, and a brain uh, drain issue. The reality is, is on education committee, we are dealing with a lot of things around teacher shortages and try to come up with pathways and ways to increase that workforce. Because of that, I felt it was an opportunity to look at some of the health industry that we are short and brought this bill to help address those workforce shortages. According to the Nebraska Examiner, uh, the state's 93 counties, 73 have less than the national average ratio of nurses, uh, registered nurses to patients. Four of our counties only have one registered nurse. Nine counties don't even have a single registered nurse at all. LB 974 offers a solution and a financial incentive to uh, non-Nebraskans or Nebraskans to come to Nebraska and enter an accelerated bachelor's pro nursing program. Under this bill, the state will offer a 40% scholarship to enter the program and then a forgive 20% after three years of working in the field, uh, a nursing field. If a nurse completes the program and works as a nurse for three years, then all of the nurses tuition will be forgiven. The total cost of the program is $10 million, $4 million for the fiscal year of 23-24 and $6 million for 24-25. This program could potentially result in over 100 nurses being recruited to the state, staying in the state and serving our and filling in our work shortage. Right now, there are around 4, 000, we are short around 4,000 nurses in this state. It's one of the critical things that we need for healthcare and that's why I brought this bill. And with that, I will answer any questions. Thank you. Are there any questions from the committee? Yes, Senator Reapy. Thank you. Senator, good to see you. Good to see you. Uh, my question, is this a Creighton bill specifically? Uh, what makes you think that? Uh, no, I'm not, uh, no, it's not a Creighton bill specifically. It's, it's just a bill that I did work with Creighton on development. Uh, when I was looking at what they're doing in Arizona, they have a similar uh, accelerator program that they use ARPA dollars for, 
um, and they're having a huge success. So I didn't base it off of that program with Creighton. Yes. I know Creighton has a growing program in Phoenix uh, in terms of medical school, et cetera. Um, I guess, you know, one of my questions would be is what percentage of, and I, I was going under the assumption it was fundamentally a Creighton piece for the 10 million as my question got to be is the probability of Creighton nurses uh, leaving Omaha, leaving Nebraska, going to Western rural Nebraska? So there's two parts. One, there's some people behind me who might be able to answer that question okay. better. But part of what we try to do in this bill was allow the 20% forgiven each year for the three years to make sure people stay here for three years. And I believe if we get those students coming out of college who are uh, staying here for three years, that they're mo most likely to stay because they'll, they'll have roots here. My guess is, too, that a nursing degree from Creighton is probably a more expensive degree than it would be from a nursing degree from, say, Nebraska, a state school. I can't accept the oh. premise of the question because I don't know the answer to that. So okay. That's good. Okay, thank you, sir. Any other questions? Seeing none, see it close. Uh, I don't know. I'm in a probes, and I'm, i got two other hearings in judiciary, so I may be back. We're going to be watching it for to answer any questions maybe at the end. But if not, uh, you can exec on this bill today and kick it out. Uh, it's in my top five choices for a priority bill, so I really would appreciate it. Well, we'll definitely take that into consideration. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Senator Wade. All right, we'll take our first testifier and support. Top five. Thank you. Good afternoon, Senator Hansen and members of the committee. My name is Mardell Wilson, M-A-R-D-E-L-L-W-I-L-S-O-N, and I serve as provost and chief academic officer at Creighton University. I extend my thanks to the members of the committee for the opportunity to testify on behalf of Creighton University as a proponent of LB 794. The nursing shortage in Nebraska is of critical concern. It has been predicted that in two short years, Nebraska will have 5,000 fewer nurses than what is needed to care for our citizens. Addressing this crisis requires a multifaceted strategy that opens various pathways, embraces public-private partnerships, and creates incentivized options to rapidly increase the nursing workforce. Creighton University celebrates its 145th year as one of 27 Jesuit colleges and universities in the United States. With degree programs that emphasize education of the whole person, academically, socially, and spiritually, Creighton is nationally recognized for providing a challenged and balanced educational experience, serving more than 8,000 undergraduate, graduate, and professional students. From all 50 states and U.S. territories, as well as more than 40 countries are represented among the student body. In addition to our 140 distinct academic pathways offered among the nine colleges and schools, Creighton maintains a comprehensive and robust portfolio in the health professions, including dentistry, medicine, pharmacy, OT, PT, PA, and nursing. With many counties in Nebraska not meeting the national average of nurses to patient ratio, and as Senator Wayne acknowledged, almost 10% of Nebraska counties reporting no registered nurses in the county, we are at a critical crossroads. The accelerated nursing program at Creighton University has been a proven leader with one of the oldest, most respected programs in the country. The program began in 1975 at the Omaha campus and extended west in 1986 to meet the student needs of students and communities both in the metropolitan and rural areas of Nebraska. It is a 12-month curriculum for individuals who hold non-nursing baccalaureate or higher degrees or in a combination with an established 3 plus 1 articulation agreement for a dual degree with one of those degrees being the accelerated bachelor's in nursing. Our students are exceptionally well prepared by completing more than 900 clinical hours in specialties such as medical, surgical, obstetrics, labor and delivery, pediatrics, mental health, critical care, and population and community health. The comprehensive training is evidenced as Creighton nursing graduates earn a 91% first-time NCLEX pass rate, making them workforce ready. Creighton is proud of the fact that 80% of our students come from out of state and nearly half of those students stay in Nebraska following graduation, clearly demonstrating a brain gain for the state of Nebraska. This fact is especially apparent in the health professions. More than 6,500 Creighton Health Sciences alumni work in Nebraska healthcare, 
giving our state the seventh best ranking for healthcare practitioners availability to our communities. If you remove Creighton alumni from those statistics, the healthcare workforce in Nebraska drops to 18th in the number of healthcare practitioners per 10,000 persons. Among the profession, it is well known that nursing graduates typically start working in or near the communities in which they live and study, making proximity of education a significant factor in an area's supply of nurses. At Creighton, we know that three out of four of our accelerated nursing graduates already choose to begin their careers in Nebraska, and LB 794 would incentivize interested students to pursue a career in nursing in Nebraska. The combination of tuition funds plus remission for service to Nebraska is an excellent opportunity to enhance interest, decrease barriers, and rapidly impact our nursing workforce throughout the state. Thank you, and I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you for your testimony. Are there any questions from the committee? Senator Hardin. Thanks for being here. Oops. <clears throat> it's Creighton. You guys are second to none. What's it cost to get a nursing degree there? $62,000. $62,000? Yes, sir. Okay. That's all in. All in. Yeah. Forgive me. What does all in mean? Uh, that's cost of tuition plus fees plus we factor in cost of living. Okay. So this is $2,500 towards that experience. Is that per year? This okay. particular uh, item is more than 2,500 is my understanding. Oh, is it? Okay. All right. Very good. Thanks for the big picture. Right. Any other questions? Senator Ricky? <clears throat> Thank you, Chairman. Uh, Creed's a great school. And pretty good basketball school too. Uh, I guess my piece would be is I spent a lot of time in, in healthcare in, in Omaha, part of it at Berg, a number of years. Our general feeling was that in the professional fields, particularly dental and medical school, that the Creighton professional schools were fundamentally the University of California at Creighton or the University of Utah at Creighton. Uh, but not a lot of them stayed around Nebraska and particularly outside the urban Omaha market. So, you know, for the state to put in $10 million. And just the other day, we we talked with another group that wants $10 million for clinical sites. And so $10 million seems to be a favorite number that runs along on when, when we talk about nursing. I'm just, you. would you reiterate how many, did you say stay in Omaha? Of our percent? nursing program, three out of four of our students remain in Nebraska. Really? Following graduation. Okay. Right. They do better than the other professional schools, and thank you. Yes. Okay. Thank you, sir. Yep. Any other questions from the committee? Uh, can you answer, like, out of the 75% that stay, out of, or actually out of the 100%, how many of those are from out of state? Do you know? So, like, how many of the nursing program that are out We'd have to follow the math. So, 80% of our students, student body in totality, are from out of state and 50% of the 80% stay if you, yep. and then okay. four, three out of four of those individuals remain in Nebraska from the nursing program alone. So yeah, I was just trying, highly, to, I'm yeah. Just trying to get run the numbers because this is for out of state, you know, right. for those coming yeah. from out of the state, but then if you're like, oh, yeah, 90% of them end up leaving anyway. So it's like, what? We have um, statistics. I reported you statistics for the entire university, yeah. which is the 80% come from out of state, 50% of them stay. What we do know out of all of our nursing graduates, three out of four, room, their first okay. position after graduation is in Nebraska. Sure. Gotcha. Okay. Yes, Senator Hart. Also, just a, another big picture question. Um, what can someone with a, a BSN from Creighton hope to make if they stay somewhere in the Lincoln Omaha or even go back to where I'm from in Western Nebraska. Is that a good idea to spend that much money on a degree program is essentially the, the myself and other parents are posing that question. I have one who's working on a BSN right now. It's an excellent question. I do not know the exact starting wages within both Omaha or in outstate myself. Okay. Um, what I am told is that our students remain interested and it's still a very competitive degree at Creighton. Thanks. All right, any other questions? Seeing none, thank you for your testimony. Mm -hmm. We'll take next test fire and support.
Hello, well, thank you, Chairman Hansen and members of the committee. My name is Dr. Ann Hardy, it's A-N-N-E-H-A-R-T-Y, and I'm an assistant professor of nursing at Creighton in, the, uh, in nursing. I teach leadership, population health, and community health nursing. I'm a proud Nebraskan, and I am here to share my story with you and ask for your support of LB 794. I grew up in Sacramento, California, and first moved to Nebraska in 1993 to study nursing at Creighton. My sister was one year ahead of me, also a Creighton nursing student. My family chose Creighton because we knew other students from Sacramento who attended Creighton before us. Their families all spoke highly of Creighton and of Nebraska. I was excited to move to a new state and was immediately welcomed by my roommate, Jennifer Roberts, a young woman from David City. Many of you know her as Jen Krieger, Senior Vice President of Public Policy at the Greater Omaha Chamber. Jen is the reason I began to fall in love with Nebraska. She introduced me to a culture I was not familiar with before. Most importantly, Jen showed me that Nebraskans genuinely care for one another. She also taught me that dinner comes before supper and that few things are more sacred than Runza and Husker football. <laughs> We grew up to become the best of friends as we navigated Omaha and Creighton together. As an undergraduate student, I began to understand and experience the beautiful relationship between Creighton and the greater Omaha area. I felt as if I could go anywhere, a hospital, a clinic, a pharmacy, or a local business, and people had a connection to Creighton. This special relationship was also like nothing I had experienced before, and Omaha became my home. My California high school boyfriend, Pat, joined me in Omaha during my senior year. Upon graduating from Georgetown, Pat chose to attend Creighton Medical School, a place he did not know of before he met me. I graduated and immediately started assisting Dr. Henry Lynch with his hereditary cancer research. At the same time, I was a graduate student at Creighton to become a family nurse practitioner. When I graduated as a family nurse practitioner and Pat graduated from medical school in 2000, we continued to make Omaha our home. I worked as an NP for Creighton Nephrology Associates, and during my time in nephrology, I became involved in the American Nephrology Nurses Association, ANNA, initially as the state chapter, Nebraska State Chapter President. I was recognized at the, as the youngest chapter leader at a leadership conference in Dallas, Texas in 2001. I was invited to address 300 plus leaders in attendance and was able to tell them I was there because of how welcoming the Nebraska ANNA members were and members and officers had been to me, putting our state chapter on the map. Our twin daughters were born at Creighton and baptized at St. John's Parish on Creighton's campus in 2003. I stayed involved in ANNA and continued to work at Creighton Nephrology until Pat's radiology residency was completed in the summer of 2005. We moved to Illinois for one additional year for training for Pat and then were faced with making a difficult decision, return to Omaha, a place we love and had built our beautiful life for ourselves or move back to Sacramento to raise our daughters and your family. We chose to move back to Sacramento where we lived for 16 years. We visited Omaha often, at least twice a year and talked about moving back, but the timing was never right. While in Sacramento, I worked as a school nurse and became a Creighton student for a third time entering uh, um, I earned a doctorate of education in interdisciplinary leadership. In the fall of 2021, I anticipated our daughter's 2022 high school graduation. Pat and I had no opportunities for growth in our careers in Sacramento, and the girls would be leaving. So I told Pat I was going to apply for Creighton College of Nursing. He said, I better call my friends and former residency mates and see if they have a job for me. We were both offered opportunities we could not pass up and decided to move back to Omaha in July of 2022. Pat and I are so happy to be home in Nebraska, where our family and professional lives began. I have my dream job of being a part of the formation of the next generation of Creighton nursing, nurses through teaching and mentoring both traditional and accelerated nursing students. My nest is empty at home, but so full of all of my students. Pat has joined radiology consultants of the Midwest as an interventional radiologist, and as a recognized expert in his field, he has brought innovative procedures to Nebraska that have not been offered here before. He has already enhanced the lives of many of our fellow Nebraskans and represented his group, giving educational presentations to physicians in California. We are also Creighton parents. 
I share our family story as a testament to the greatness of Creighton and the greatness of Nebraska. Creighton excels at bringing out-of-state students to Nebraska and exposing them to all the opportunities that are waiting for them here. When every state is in a battle for talent, it is important that we try to leverage our existing strengths and build on them to improve our outcomes. When we, all of us here today, invest in Creighton, Nurse, Creighton University nursing students, we are investing in the future of Nebraska. Our nursing students are collaborative scholars, reflective and compassionate practitioners, collaborative professionals, and global citizens who contribute to enhancing the lives of the communities they serve. I assure you that an investment in Creighton nursing students will enhance the lives of all Nebraskans. Okay, thank you. I didn't want to cut you off. I'm sorry. I know I saw that. No, I, I think Nebraska that. tourism might give me a call and yell at me. <laughs> you like, should make a commercial about your journey. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> I used to work in admissions for Creighton too and recruited a lot of out of state students, a lot of them who have stayed. And Jen's okay too. She's all right. She's so. a good, she's a good gal. We'll keep her. <laughs> all right. Any questions from the committee? Senator Kavanaugh. No, I was just going to say, I feel like, is Jen up for a promotion or? <laughs> uh, because certainly she's a great advocate for yes. our city and our town. Yes. My mom is also a Creighton graduate from out of state. Mm -hmm. Um, but she did meet somebody at Creighton who, who <laughs> kept her here, I think, but also she's a Gallagher gal. I yes. don't know if Gallagher yeah, Hall was there yeah, when you were yeah, there. But, yeah, my sister was um, an RA there. My brother um, did had a, a um, LR for us to sign for one of the Creighton athletic mm -hmm. teams, and um, people keep saying, they're like, oh, did you go to Creighton? I did not go to Creighton. I feel like I went to Creighton, but I didn't go to Creighton. So thank you for coming here, for staying here, for raising your family here, and for sharing your story with us. Thank you. And for lauding our wonderful Jen Creighton. Yes. <laughs> Any other questions from the committee? <clears throat> yes, yes, Senator Herb. Um, from 100,000 feet up, can you kind of describe this degree program to me in terms of what it contains and yes. how long it takes start to finish. I yep. see it saying 12 months. Yeah, but... it's 12 months. So students get, they come to us already. Well, there's two pathways. One is that they already have a bachelor's degree. Okay. Some, a lot of them already have a master's degree too okay. from somewhere else. It, or it could be from Creighton. Yeah. They, maybe they didn't choose nursing out of the gates to do the traditional direct entry. So they already have a bachelor's degree. They've taken all their nursing prerequisite courses, which is essentially our freshman and sophomore level courses that they've taken either at Creighton or somewhere else. They get a degree in something. And then they take all the other, um, it, they come to us for 12 months. So it's basically all the nursing class, upper level nursing classes. So it's essentially junior and senior year of what would be our traditional undergrad program in a 12 month period. Okay. So it's a BSN? It's a BSN, yes. So they get a, another bachelor's degree. Gotcha. And then we also have, um, a pathway where students, in, in, including in rural Nebraska, can get a three, um, it's a three plus one program. So they'll start undergraduate somewhere else, like in Hastings, do three years there, and then come to Creighton for one year. I see. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, any other questions from the committee? Seeing none. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. I'll take the next testifier in support of LB 794. Anybody else wishing to testify in support? Seeing none. Is there anybody who wishes to testify in opposition? Seeing none. Is there anybody who wishes to testify in a neutral capacity to LB 794? Thank you. I chair Hanson and members of the uh, Health and Human Services Committee. Uh, hello, my name is Lindsay Snipes, L-I-N-D-S-A-Y-S-N-I-P-E-S. -S -S, and I am the Vice President of Institutional Effectiveness at Nebraska Methodist College. Uh, we are located in Omaha, Nebraska. I'm here re representing uh, Nebraska Methodist College and we are members of the Council for Independent Colleges, Nebraska Colleges, SINC. Uh, which is an organization comprised of all 13 independent post-secondary institutions in the state. NMC is an accredited private not-for-profit nursing and healthcare college. We are affiliated with the Nebraska Methodist Health System and founded as the Methodist Hospital School of Nursing in 1891. 
with enrollment of about 100, or excuse me, 1,100 students. NMC is small enough to truly care about each student and large enough to provide outstanding undergraduate graduate certificate programs in nursing and health, allied health. <clears throat> NMC's mission is to provide uh, educational experiences for the development of individuals in order that they may positively influence the health and well-being of the community. Our mission makes us makes NMC uniquely driven and prepared to address the dire nursing shortages across the state. Nebraska Methodist College and SYNC appreciate Senator Wayne for introducing LB 794, the Nursing Incentive Scholarship Act that if passed will quickly deliver additional nurses to Nebraska's workforce through accelerated bachelor's of science nursing programs and provide a financial source of support that is significant to students. The intent of this bill is good. However, the language could be clearer and should be broader to allow for more high quality accelerated nursing programs to qualify under the act, help more nursing student graduates with lower debt and address the growing nursing workforce shortage. Specifically under, the, under section two, one A, partnership with a statewide affil clinical affiliate is unclear and may limit participation under the proposed act. NMC has many partnerships with hospitals and clinics across the state, but it is unclear what is meant by partnership with a statewide clinical affiliate. NMC has a well-established 12-month accelerated nursing program culminating in a BSN. Our past three-year enrollment has averaged 60 students per cohort with a 90% retention rate and 100% persistence rate at the institution. Our first-time NCLEX pass rates averaged 93% over the past 10 years. Inclusive of all NMC's BSN programs, we are the third largest producer of BSN graduates in the state, only behind UNMC and Creighton University. NMC's accelerated cohorts have also historically enrolled students from out of state, and we have the capacity for growth. In closing, uh, Nebraska has a significant shortage of nurses, and LB 794 is an important bill towards attracting and educating future nurses and growing Nebraska's nursing workforce. However, I would ask, that the ask for the language to be reviewed and for the committee to remove restrictive language to allow other health colleges like Nebraska Methodist College and ex its accelerated nursing program students to participate. Thank you for your time and attention. And I'll take any questions. Thank you. Any questions from the committee? Senator Reby. Thank you, Chairman. <clears throat> My question would be this is because we've heard from the Nebraska Hospital Association and they have a very, what they describe as a very expansive workforce development program. And I'm trying to say, we have bits and pieces coming at us from, with dollar requests, some of them fairly substantial. How do they all play together? Do you have, do your group have a relationship or a work, something with the Nebraska Hospital Association? Because they have a desperate need for nurses as well. Uh, Senator, I, I probably can't speak to how all the bills work together. I will say that we do have a relationship, particularly through our Methodist health system, uh, that does trickle into the college. We have a good relationship with Nebraska, um, the, the health center, uh, in, in some of the bills that were introduced with the clinical affiliation, clinical affiliate sites, and, and look forward to exploring that. Uh, this in particular is geared towards that accelerated uh, nursing degree, which accelerates nurses into our workforce with students that come in with credit, with uh, already having credits towards a bachelor's degree, having a bachelor's degree. And our program in particular uh, also accepts associate degree paired, prepared students so that they can accelerate from an associate's degree to a BSN in one in 12 months. So it's, it's about getting those uh, workforce, those nurses in the workforce quicker. My guess is that they're interested in turning out nurses that can Take their boards and become registered nurses. That's great. Uh, my question gets to be is do we get into double counting? You know, if they get 15 million, does that include your 10 million or is that your 10 million in addition to their 15 million? Or as you know, as as a, a body, legislative body, we have to try to sort that out best we can to make sure that we have as much cohesiveness and focus. I think we're all focusing on this. We understand and recognize the need. Now it's the best approach to get there at the most cost effective way that we can possibly do that. At least that's where I come from. Absolutely. And, you know, very respectably, this particular bill, I think, again, is a good bill because it puts um, the financials with the student. It helps the student 
uh, take care of their education, get into the workforce, uh, live a good life in Nebraska with a, with a little bit less debt um, and lets them take off in their career and get some roots here in Nebraska as well. May I ask one more question? I have one more question. Sure. On your accelerated program, I assume that these are individuals who already have a, a bachelor's degree. Can you help me out? What what do most of them, they don't come with a bachelor's degree in agriculture, I assume, or is... Uh, actually, no, not agriculture, but we do see a variety of degrees. Um, we do see bachelor's degrees as our most common that comes through our accelerated program. Uh, but we do have, uh, as I mentioned, an associate's path. Uh, so you can essentially have an associate's degree to your degree program, come into a 12-month bachelor's accelerated program, and end up with a BSN within three years, which is fairly cost-effective for a student going into the healthcare careers. Um, biology, your health sciences tend to be most popular, but I have got the chance to speak with uh, some of our um, students currently. We have a few engineering, we have some psychology, uh, we even have some that uh, come in with some history majors uh, from their previous um, uh, bachelor's degrees. So it's, it's all about that patient care, and the, the BSN is a powerful degree. Uh, it, it's stackable um, as you go up in education, but there's a lot of ways you can use a bachelor's of science in nursing, and, and that's what's really great about the degree. Okay. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank, thank you. you yeah. Any other questions from the committee? Saturday. Thank you, Chairman Hanson, <clears throat> and thank you, Ms. Snipes, for being here today. So I just want to clarify. Um, it sounds like, and I think we heard this in testimony already, that your perspective is that this bill would per only apply to students that are going to Creighton, or could potentially only apply to students at Creighton, and you're looking for langu a language change that would make it more expansive, so students going to other schools could utilize the program. Is that what you're... Yes, in, in, in the... Uh... Section 2-1A, uh, there is uh, some language that may be ambiguous as far as what that would actually mean, a partnership with a statewide clinical affiliate. While Nebraska Beth Methodist College has um, clinical affiliations to provide clinical education with hospitals and clinics throughout the state, the definition of what that particularly means may limit if it means, say, a, a hospital organization that is just one organization across the state. Okay. Okay. So are you looking to strike that language or, or further the definition? So, or? yeah, great question. Thank you for, for mm -hmm. asking. Uh, what we are looking to do is one of two things, either define it, um, define a partnership with a statewide clinical affiliate as any hospital or clinic okay. across the state sure. or strike it from the bill. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Because that's what I was trying to get to is I have nothing against Creighton. I think it's a wonderful school. I have a very bright staff member that's a Creighton alumni. Um, but it does give me a little bit of heartburn when we have a bill asking for funds that could only apply to one school and not maybe a larger pool of students that could be going to different locations and or maybe more likely to stay in rural Nebraska, like Senator Reapy had mentioned earlier. Absolutely. And, you know, we respect Creighton's uh, nursing program. Uh, we work well in the same city and oftentimes with many community partners together. Um, I am also a Creighton grad, graduated from their law school um, many years ago. But um, what we're just looking for is a chance to have our students participate in the program. And I think having uh, the bill talk, of, talk about having clinical affiliates within the state, having those partnerships within the state is important. That, that keeps we tend to look at that last piece of your nursing education, that preceptorship, and going into um, your practice of nursing and pairing our students with clinical spots where they want to work, experiences where they're going to end up working. And we feel like that can be an important piece to it, too. But the clarification to say it's not just one type of clinical partnership. It can be partnerships with, you know, hospitals and clinics throughout the state. Okay, wonderful. Thank you. You bet. Any other questions? I have a few. Sure. Uh, I, I'm sorry if I missed it, or if you answer it with Senator Day's questioning. How many how many accelerated programs are there in Nebraska? You know, I I can only I only know of three um, with Creighton, and UNMC, and UNMC. Okay. 
Okay. Uh, right. Other our other health sciences college may have may have some as well. Uh, those are the three I'm most aware of. Okay, and I'm going to touch a little bit off what she was at, Senator Day was asking as well. Um, so, somebody who comes to you with an associates, mm -hmm. and they still need some more training to earn their bachelor's and then go to the accelerated program. You offer both, or you just go right from when they come with an associate. Yes, you can come in with an associates, and there's a pathway to earn your bachelor's within 12 months. Okay, so that, yeah, so earning your bachelor's within the 12 months is that part of the accelerated nursing program? Yes. So this would be used for that as well. Yes. Okay. All right. That's what I was wondering because that might that's the difference than like costing more per student. Um, and some of this I might ask you, but you might be the last testifier, so at least I can ask it since Senator Wayne isn't here. Um, on line 13 on page two, does not live in Nebraska at the time of applying for a scholarship under the Nursing Incentive Scholarship Act. That's who, who, who is eligible for this. My, my, my question is like, so say somebody comes here and gets their bachelor's from out of state, they go to UNL and they, like, hey, I think I want to go into nursing. They're not, they're from out of state, but they're still going to college here, but they will be eligible for this, it sounds like. I wouldn't be the person to answer that question for you, sir. Okay, that's right. Just I throw it out there anyway. And one more thing uh, on section four, uh, part two, the department may award up to $6 million under the Nursing Incentive Scholarship Act for each fiscal year after fiscal year. It's like 23, 24, but I think they need to change it to 24, 25. It sounds like almost like this will go in, in uh, like in perpetuity, you know, every year. They don't have like an end date okay, for each fiscal year after 24, 25. So they don't have, it's like there's no stop date. So we'll just kind of keep awarding this money every year. So that's one thing I was going to say. I can't uh, speak to the intent of the bill there. Yeah. Uh, however, if there is scholarship dollars for the intention of putting nurses in the workforce and helping uh, those students again get their degrees in a, in a quick fashion to get them bedside or wherever they end up, um, we we would be for that. Um, yeah. Uh, as, as a fiscal conservative, so excuse me, Harper. I'm sure it does. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. I just, at least want to kind of throw this out there, and I can Absolutely. always ask Senator Wayne about them too as well. Maybe sitting behind you can answer them. So, okay, any other questions from the committee? All right, seeing none, thank you for coming to testify. Thank you all. Is there anybody else wishing to testify in the neutral capacity? All right, seeing none and not seeing Senator Wayne here, I'm assuming he's waving closing. We did have some letters for the record. We did have four letters in support of LB 794 and one letter in neutral. So with that, that'll end our hearing for LB 794. And we'll now open it up for LB 503 and welcome Senator Aguilar. Welcome Senator Aguilar. I don't think I've ever seen you in front of a committee yet so far, so it's pretty awesome. Good afternoon, Chairman Hanson members of the Health and Human Services Committee. My name is Ray Aguilar, R-A-Y-A-G-U-I-L-A-R. And I represent District 35. I'm here today to open on Legislative Bill 503. 503 would adopt the Rural Nebraska Nursing Workforce Act. There's a nursing shortage in Nebraska. Nebraska will experience the shortage of more than 5,000 nurses by the year 2025. 73 of Nebraska's 93 counties has less than the national average ratio of registered nurses to patients. 66 counties in Nebraska have been deemed medically underserved. Nine counties in Nebraska have no registered nurses and four counties have one registered nurse. LB 503 would provide both scholarship and infrastructure dollars to alleviate Nebraska's nursing workforce shortage. Creighton University sponsors a three plus one program with four other colleges in Nebraska. Students at Concordia University, York University, Hastings College and Wayne State University can complete three years of study at these institutions and one year of nursing theory and clinical onsite tr training in Grand Island and other nearby central Nebraska communities, such as Hastings, to earn their Bachelor of Science in Nursing. LB 503 would expand the current program by adding a second enrollment cycle and 16 to 20 students per enrollment. 
period for a total of 32 to 40 new nursing nurses graduating after implementation of 503. Outside of Lincoln and Omaha, Nebraska has limited nursing BSN clinical education opportunities. The program in Grand Island offers students who want to live and work outside of Omaha and Lincoln the opportunity to have the appropriate training closer to his or her home and where he or she wants to eventually work. The scholarship program would be 40% of the tuition, but the nurses would receive 20% remission of the tuition upon each year of nursing service in Nebraska. The handout I have prepared for you includes Amendment 386 to 503. The amendment is the underlying part of the bill and includes new language pertaining to the Rural Health Opportunities Program. The original contents of 503 remain in the amendment, but we are codifying and adding dollars into the RHOP program at the state college request. There will be experts testifying behind me to answer questions about the Creighton section and the state colleges section. Thank you for your time, and I will attempt to try to answer any questions you may have. All right, thank you, Senator Aguilar. Are there any questions from the committee? Saying none. We'll see it close. I'm thank probably going to wave closing. I have an exec session across the hall. All right, sounds good. Thank you. All right, we'll take our first testifier in support of LB 503. <coughs> Welcome back. Thank you. Thank you again, Senator Hansen and members of the committee. I'll remind you, I am Mardell Wilson, M-A-R-D-E-L-L-W-I-L-S-O-N, and I serve as Provost and Chief Academic Officer at Creighton University. I again, extend my thanks to the members of the committee for the opportunity to testify on behalf of Creighton University as a proponent of LB 503. I know you played paid very close attention uh, prior, so I won't give you a lot of the statistics about Creighton University, but we'll just remind a couple things. Founded in 1878 by the Creighton family, we are one of 27 Jesuit universities and colleges in the U.S. Uh, where we have a vibrant and diverse learning community that offers its students more than an education as we emphasize education of the whole person academically, socially, and spiritually. We've cited to you several times uh, throughout this afternoon already about the Nebraska shortage of nurses with uh, numbers ranging from 73 counties with less than the national average, 66 counties in Nebraska having been deemed medically underserved, nine counties in Nebraska with no registered nurses and four counties with just one. We know that the Nebraska shortage disproportionately impacts rural communities, affecting their access to quality health care and overall economic vibrance. This bill takes a refined effort to look at the rural population and how best to serve them. Addressing this shortage must require a comprehensive strategy, including public and private partnerships, as no one single institution type can tackle the nursing shortage alone. The accelerated curriculum in nursing was initiated again in, at Creighton in May of 75, and we expanded west in 1986 to Hastings and then later to Grand Island. As a one-year curriculum uh, for individuals who hold a baccalaureate or other higher degree or a combination of a three plus one articulation agreement for a dual degree, the students would earn in that program would earn a degree from their home institution as well as a BSN from Creighton. Creighton nursing graduates are successful boasting a 91% first time NCLEX pass rate, again, making them workforce ready. We are delighted to have established partnerships, three plus one programs with Wayne State College, Hastings College, York University, and Concordia University, where students complete the bulk of their undergraduate degrees at those institutions, completing their fourth year in our accelerated program in Grand Island, learning, earning them the dual degree. We know that these students already have an established affinity to more rural segments of our state. With this in mind, I'd like to point out that nursing graduates, again, typically working in or near the communities in which they live and study, making proximity of education a significant factor in an area's supply of nurses. Reminding you that three out of four of our Creighton Accelerated Nursing graduates already choose to begin their careers here in Nebraska, and that includes both our programs in Omaha as well as in Grand Island. 
LB 503 would enable program growth and additional cohort while allowing students who already have an appreciation obtaining an education in more rural Nebraska to not be burdened by the financial impact of a higher education helping eliminate any possible barriers to embrace a career in nursing serving rural Nebraskans. It's my pleasure to collaborate with these, with these other outstanding institutions and I'm happy to take any questions at this time. Thank you. Are there any questions from the committee? Senator Reed. Thank you, Chairman. Again, thank you for being back so quickly. Thank you. Uh, I'll make a statement that I want to go to a question. My concern gets to do with silos that we seem to be creating here, silos of scholarships, one for Creighton, one for rural Nebraska, one for down the line. I think that's very, in the summary of that, that puts us accountable or in charge of running the whole thing. I don't think that's a, a role for the legislature. But so, again, I would ask you the same question I asked on the previous bill. Has any coordination happened with the bigger plan of the Nebraska Hospital Association? All I can share is I sit on the Nebraska Hospital Association Workforce Collaborative, and that group has identified our, the two bills that have been presented this morning or this afternoon already, as well as additional ones. At our most recent meeting, there was no opposition. Um, I think that the, the goal is to tackle this nursing shortage, and we're trying to do it in ways that not only allow students the greatest flexibility, but also, also with this particular Bill 503, uh, really trying to assure there's affinity with helping our more rural areas. I would like to just see personally see one master plan that covers all of the corners so that we don't have to deal with them on an individual basis. Uh, could you answer me this too? I know that you have <coughs> an expanding medical presence in Phoenix. Uh, do you have nursing education now? We do. Which, where do you, do you have more students in Omaha, nursing students in Omaha or Phoenix? We have about an equal portion of nursing students in Phoenix as we do in Omaha. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, uh, Senator Day. Thank you, Chairman Hanson. Thank you for your second testimony for today. Um, <clears throat> this may have been a question that I should have asked to Senator Aguilar, um, but in section one, um, subsection two, uh, line 13, part C says, be from a rural area of Nebraska as determined by XXX, essentially. There's no definition there. Do you have any indication that the senator had a desire to, I mean, how are we going to determine who's from a rural area and who's not, or was that? I am not, I cannot okay. speak specifically. I know, to I, apologize. I apologize. I probably should have asked the senator, but I thought maybe if you knew what was going on with that, but thank you. Thank you. Thank you. If, if I may, or if you know, how many students do you think would be eligible for this? Well, we currently have cohorts. What we're hoping to do is expand a cohort. We have a cohort of uh, approximately 18 right now, and we hope to expand that to two cohorts of 16. So that would add nearly double uh, just because of facilities and uh, because we're in a smaller area allowing appropriate number of clinical placement opportunities. We have to keep that in mind. So it would be actually in, in this particular case, uh, we would be able to add one additional cohort. Okay. And this is maybe, uh, this is a little bit of a technical question again, but since I don't think Senator Aguilar he took, took off already. Uh, on line 20 on the first page, is the intent of legislature appropriate $300,000 in fiscal year 23-24 and $600,000 in fiscal year 24-25 to the Board of Trustees of the Nebraska State College to carry out the Rural Opportunities Program. So it's their job to carry out the program, but then on the fiscal note, they have to hire a full-time employee at $95,000 a year to implement the program. I'm trying to figure all that out. I apologize that I don't know those that's details. A, again, put it, put it out there. So, um, all right, that's all I had. Any other questions? Senator Hart. <clears throat> Forgive me. I promise to pick on everyone else, just like I'm about to pick on you. Is that okay? That is fine. I tease everyone since I'm from Scotts Bluff uh, area. I was there for my son's state golf, ball, golf tournament. And I, I often have to remind my brethren from here in eastern Nebraska that if they're looking at a hard copy map of the state of Nebraska, they do need to fold it out four more times to the left to see where rural Nebraska and the, mo the most of it actually is located. All of the places that this supports 
are pretty much to the east side, eastern part of the state. Is there anything that would send anybody out our way, as far as you know, with this bill? Specifically, our clinical placement affiliation ability to execute the program is in Grand Island. Um, I suppose with... Do you consider that Western Nebraska? <laughs> I grew up in central Illinois in a, in a very small, small community, so I understand uh, your comments. I do recognize what we hope in terms of these partnerships is that those students who are possibly looking at four-year institutions, this seems more of a doable for them. And then we're present for that fourth year. Just like to pick on everyone equally. Got it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions from the committee? Right. Seeing none, thank you. We'll take our next test fire support. Welcome. Good afternoon, Senator and members of the committee. My name is Meredith Smith, M E R E D I T H S M I T H. I'm speaking on behalf of Creighton University College of Nursing as a faculty member from the Central Nebraska campus located in Grand Island. I've been a nurse for 25 years and have worked as a nurse educator for the past 12 years. I've had the opportunity to work closely with students, both in the clinical and the didactic setting. Creighton has had a longstanding presence in Central Nebraska, preparing BSN nurses in the area. Creighton's Central Nebraska campus allows students the opportunity to have classroom and clinical experiences at several facilities between Grand Island, Kearney, and Hastings. Creighton University has strong relationships with CHI facilities in Grand Island and Kearney, as well as Mary Landing Healthcare in Hastings. Students also work with different health-related agencies in the community, such as the Multicultural Coalition, the Literacy Council, and Goodwill Industries. Students interact with the leadership and the clients at these agencies to perform a needs assessment and implement an intervention to address social determinants of health and identified needs. This clinical opportunity introduces students to resources available in the community and allows students to develop a connection within the community, building affinity, which in turn may increase their interest in staying in the community after graduation. Nursing leadership at these facilities works to accommodate Creighton's clinical requests to have an excellent clinical experience for our students. Representatives from these facilities are very welcoming to our students, which enhances their experiences. Creighton's current facilities in Grand Island accommodate one cohort of 16 to 20 nursing students per year. While expansion is desired, there would be some limitations with the current infrastructure. The funds from LB 503 would allow for expansion, which would include a second classroom to fit an additional 16 to 20 students, additional space to teach health assessment and nursing skills, as well as an extra room for simulation. This increased space would benefit the students who would receive scholarship money from LB 503 and provide the opportunity to increase future capacity for the number of nurses we can educate in central Nebraska. Creighton's location in Grand Island is in a good geographical location to attract students from smaller communities. We currently have students enrolled from Central City, Aurora, Giltner, Donovan, Lexington, Hastings, and Grand Island. Grand Island's central location allows students to live in other communities and have a reasonable commute to campus. We also recruit around 25% of our students from out of state. Creighton's campus in central Nebraska has had many graduates choose to remain close to home after graduating. This has recently included nurses working in Geneva, Minden, York, Grand Island, Kearney, and Hastings. The cost of an accelerated nursing program can be prohibitive, but the funds from LB 503 would allow individuals without the available financial resources to make a nursing career a reality. Because of the large shortage of nurses in central Nebraska, there are often opportunities available for new graduates that may not be available in metropolitan Nebraska. Students in central Nebraska have been able to secure their preferred jobs in labor and delivery, the NIC unit, mental health, other inpatient settings, and at the surgery centers immediately after graduation. The Grand Island campus 
has had great success with recruiting students from outside Nebraska in 2021 when scholarship dollars were available for the program. With there being no incentive to stay in Nebraska after graduating, many of these students returned home. If LB 503 passes, students in this situation may be enticed to stay in Nebraska to receive scholarship and tuition remission. The Grand Island campus has a three plus one partnership with Hastings College, York University, Concordia University, and Wayne State College. These partnerships allow students to attend one of the previously mentioned institutions for three years and then enroll in Creighton's 12 month accelerated program. At the end of four years, students obtain a bachelor's degree from their first institution and a BSN from Creighton University. The ability of these rural institutions to offer a nursing major as an option in partnership with Creighton allows them to recruit students interested in a nursing career. These other colleges and universities recruit students from both inside in that out of state of college, or excuse me, in state and out state of Nebraska. Many students at these colleges prefer the smaller class size over the larger class size and the smaller community. The small nursing class sizes in Grand Island is often very appealing for our students from these other colleges. Ms. Smith, I might have you wrap up your thoughts. You oh, really went off a little while ago. Sorry. We admit LB. 503 passes, this would provide incentives for students to stay uh, or pursue a nursing education and encourage them to stay in Nebraska after graduating from Creighton University. I urge your support in LB 503. Thank you. All right. Thank you for that. Are there any questions from the committee? All right. Senator Reefy. Thank you. It's uh, my understanding that last year uh, we did have a loan program that we funded with some ARPA funding funds. And my question gets to be as rather than providing scholarships, should we as an organization provide low interest loans so that uh, while it's not a free ride, it also has an incentive, if you will, to go in that nursing direction. I don't know if I can answer to that as far as a loan program. As I'm not familiar with it okay. or if there would be an option for that. I'm told that they, that was part of last year. I assume that was last sessions to ring a bell. I wasn't here. Maybe some of my other proponents could answer that question okay. better. Yeah, thank you. I just thought I'd put it out there. That's okay. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay. Senator Harden. Uh, thanks for being here. We've been educated this week about the 5,400 nurses or so that we think we're going to be short um, in, within two years or so. How many nurses do we have coming out of Nebraska right now in terms of that we graduate across all of our, you know, about how, how bleak is the situation? How, how, how long will it take us to essentially <coughs> catch up by 2025? Will that number be up to 7,000 or will we make, will we gain on it? I, that I, I don't know if I can speak to, but I will tell you an interesting fact. I am currently in my doctorate position and one of the classes I took told, um, informed us that by 2025, we would be over 5,500 positions short in the state of Nebraska. While I can't tell you how many we could, your question again was to- Is basically, are we gaining on this? Or is that I mean, number just gonna, when we get to 2025, is it gonna be a much bigger number yet by 2027 or 2029 or? That, I, I don't know if I can tell the future for that. I, I'll be honest with you. Maybe my, my proponents could answer that better, but um, I'm, a, I'm, I'm an optimist. I'm hoping that we can, um, decrease this shortage in number and through this LB 503, I think it would definitely make it an option, certainly from um, students um, or people who already have their undergraduate degree and want to go back into nursing. Um, I have personal testimonies I've met with over the weekend that said that if this was an option for them, they would definitely consider it um, using this scholarship money to to enable them. I mean, it's an expensive program. And so when you have 40% of it being paid for and then 20% each year for three years, um, it makes it very feasible. So I think the numbers speak for themselves. Thank you. Yeah. Senator Ballard. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for being here. Did you say most of your students are commuters to the to your program? Um, for this cohort specifically that I'm currently teaching in, they I would say we have one in Aurora, one that drives from Lexington, one, two that drive from Hastings, and then the rest are in Grand Island. Okay. 
Hast so it's fairly close. Hastings, you can make to Grand Island in roughly yeah. 20, 25 minutes. Of course. So what does the program look like? So are they in class all day? Um, nope. So um, with the cohort that I'm currently course leading right now, they have class on Mondays and Fridays, generally um, most of the day. Um, sometimes it changes. They have clinical Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. Clinical can mean they could be in an inpatient clinical setting or in a community setting. So um, they are currently enrolled with me in a mental health rotation. They're in a community rotation and they're in the OB Peds rotation. So we break them into three sections. And so depending upon what section they are in, that determines what clinical they will be in Tuesday, Wednesday, or Thursday. However, all of them will be in class on Mondays and Fridays. Okay, okay. And then you, one more question, I mean, do you find it difficult to recruit candidates for, for this cohort, especially in Grand Island? Uh, you know, I had in the year 2021 and even <clears throat> I'd say 2021, I, I also helped with recruiting, going out to Hastings College and York University <laughs> and having that presence on campus and letting students see the face of Creighton um, seems to be very promising. Our numbers have gone up significantly so. So I think if that answers your question, it, I don't, I just think that the more presence we have on these other colleges that we partner with will make a big difference in getting students um, enrolled into our program. Because quite frankly, when I first started um, going to these different colleges, they didn't know that their own college had a partnership with us, with Creighton. And so by going to these different colleges, Wayne, um, Concordia, Hastings, uh, and so forth, it, it, it certainly has helped with our enrollment numbers. So you don't see a, a desire for my, many of these students to go to Omaha to go to the... In, with my experience, and I've been with Creighton for three years, a little bit over, we had um, our this cohort that I'm, I'm currently speaking to that started in August, we had around 20 students. One of those did go to Omaha to the best of my knowledge. Um, and then one other didn't feel it was their time for her to go to school. And then the rest um, stayed with us. Perfect. Thank you for being here. Yeah, thank you. Hi, folks. I'm Randy. I'm sorry. I have one. Nope, sorry. Uh, my question is this. <clears throat> a couple of days ago, I kind of lose track of all of it, but we had one school that was saying, talking about sites, and they said they had to turn away some 700 students who had applied that they thought were well qualified. Uh, you're associated with the Creighton program. Correct. Do you know if the Creighton has to reject students because they don't have clinical facilities? With my experience with Creighton and their clinical experiences, um, we've not had to reject students yeah. to okay. clinical experience, whether it's in an inpatient setting or a community setting. Okay. We work very hard to make sure that all of our students get the well, they have to, the required clinical hours. And so um, we have not found it. While it is a competitive world uh, to find any nursing student with any program, their clinical hours, um, it's challenging. But so far, we have not had problems finding placements for our students. Do your students, excuse me, yeah, but your students, do they do most of their clinical work at what I call Burger Mercy? Well, since we're in Grand Island, Oh, we do okay. it at oh. St. Francis okay. um, in Grand Island. We also um, partner with Mary Lanning Hospital. We have other uh, York Memorial Hospital. Mm -hmm. We've even been to Geneva for preceptorships for some of our students. So we have quite a, a what's the word I'm looking for? We have quite a few options for our students to go for their clinical mm -hmm. experience. Does Mary Lanning have its, do they have a relationship with Hastings College or? For nursing, or Mary Lanning has a relationship with Brian College of Health Sciences. Oh, okay, that's big. Mm -hmm. And I think Brian's expanding out there. If I'm correct. Okay. But Creighton also has a relationship with Mary Lanning as well, and with uh, as I previously mentioned, with mm -hmm. Hastings College. I do know Brian has a ninety-five percent retention rate within the state of Nebraska. So, for what that's worth, thank you. Yeah. Thank you, sir. I'm, I'm also a Brian student, so. Oh, yeah. Okay. Any other questions from the committee? All right. Can I ask you one question? Mm -hmm. Can I ask you one question real quick? Yeah. I'm not going to let you leave, leave that easy. What's that? I'm not going to let you leave, leave that easy. You can't tell I'm sweating and I'm nervous <laughs> here. Sorry. Oh, good. I'm going to ask you the most difficult question I can think of. Okay. <laughs> no. Since we got you here, is there anything else you think the state could do besides giving scholarships to help 
facilitate the process of getting more nursing students here or accelerating them through school faster? Because some industries kind of sometimes have us look at some of the red tape or rules and regulations that the state puts on industries to see if we can help kind of speed things along, such as the application process the state might require people to do or the number of hours or something. Is there anything in your mind you think the state could do? To expedite. Yeah, get more nurses here besides throwing more money at something. Well, money does always speak loudly, yeah. first and foremost. Just don't um, tell my taxpayer. You know, <laughs> nursing education is very expensive. If the state could figure out a way to help um, with loans, to help with um, um, forgiveness, debt forgiveness, uh, maybe even paying for um, helping um, with, I'm trying to think what's the word I'm thinking for, their cost of living, so to say, while they're in, in nursing school. Um, it, there's... There's several different ideas out there. I just think we need to brainstorm them, and you kind of caught me off guard. So I'll be okay. thinking about it, and I'll, I'll That's let you know. That's good. Yep. Excellent. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Any other questions? All right. Seeing none, thank you. Thank you. All right. We'll take our next test card in support of LB 503. Welcome. Well, good afternoon. My name is Carol Hammock, C-A-R-O-L-H-A-M-I-K. And I'm currently in a position, I was just appointed to at Barry Landing as a nurse recruiter and clinical outreach director, where I've spent many years at the bedside being a nursing leader. I'm a proud nurse who 37 years ago started my nursing educational journey with Creighton University in the first BSN program offered in Hastings, Nebraska that you guys heard about earlier. Early on, I was committed to attending a local school to become a nurse. Some say it's a calling to be a nurse. I'm here today to provide testimony of support of LB 503 designed to address the need to improve the rural nurse workforce through offering nursing scholarships and incentives to secure nurses to work within a rural community after graduation. Had Creighton not started the rural satellite program back when I attended, I may not have achieved all the accomplishments that I have over the last 33 years. Obtaining a BSN built my knowledge level and prepared me for leadership. They brought me success within my career where I have worked in numerous positions of staff nurse, charge nurse, manager, director, over various nursing departments, all within the nursing rural workforce. My initial reason for looking at attending a local college was the instructor nurse ratio. It was lower. The professors knew me by name. They knew my talent. My family was also close, which added additional support. I was the first college graduate within my family. And my parents were outstanding role models. I never looked at any other schools outside of Hastings, as my plans were to work within the area upon graduation, and I wanted to learn the healthcare system as a student where I would become a nurse. Every day I make a difference. My career revolves around support from Mary Lanning Healthcare, a rural hospital that is committed to the community. It is imperative to strengthen the rural healthcare workforce and bring focus to needs in the manner that our rural teams require. And looking at the rural nursing workforce, I can speak with authority of difficulties seen in hiring new nurses as trends are leading nurses to urban settings. Urban settings provide specialty practices versus rural settings that provide generalized practices to keep those ill close to home. In fact, rural facilities offer telemedicine options precisely to keep patients local and connected to loved ones when dealing with health issues. We must work to attract nurses to rural communities and this assistance starts providing financial support with educational expenses. Over the last decades, I have worked in positions of hiring bedside nurses to work within a variety of nursing units and disciplines. The new generation of nurses are looking for those more specialized positions and looking to live in a community with an urban setting. But this trend can be changed by this bill. As financial assistance can expose more students to the joys of living in a smaller community like I have, and will motivate future nurses to remain within the rural communities. I'm entering my 29th year of employment at Mary Laning Healthcare in Hastings. Our hospital has been affected by the nursing shortage. Nurses are leaving the bedside. Nurses are moving to other positions and staff are accepting traveling positions for higher wages, but often not required to leave the state to work. Did you know within my facility, if you had two similar nurses with experience level equal. They both work full-time, three 12-hour shifts a week, where one is permanent staff and one is a travel agency staff. The annual pay difference is the difference of $120,000. Okay. 
This means if we recruited 10 nurses to my hospital through this scholarship, offering and eliminating 10 agency nurses, my organization would save more than $1.2 million every year. This is the long-term difference this bill will make. It is important to support the rural health care facilities so that when a loved one is required to be hospitalized, they can be cared for in a rural setting close to home in a community-based hospital. I know we've talked a lot about the nursing shortage within Nebraska, but within the United States, by the end of the year, we're going to be 1.1 million nurses short. And the shortage are always felt, it seems like, in the rural settings. Thank you, and I'd love to take any question. All right, thank you. Are there any questions from the committee? Senator Bell. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. When when trying to recruit nurses, what what are some of the the track? What are some of the talking points you use? So I've developed the talking points of how to obtain your first job, because when you look in the nursing profession, when you look at the wage they make. So earlier you asked about what a nurse makes. An average nurse in the state of Nebraska starts as a new graduate between $29 to $34 an hour. That is a lower income. So when you look at the cost of what nursing education costs them, you need to learn how to support their educational ability so they can come become a nurse. So they look for what it is we have to offer for sign-on bonuses. They look for maybe relocation money. They also look for that right culture. They want to find that organization that believes in a nurse-patient ratio. They want to find that organization that has similar values to the way I led when I was a director. And that is you have to schedule them right, then you have to pay them right. Ask them not to do anything you wouldn't do yourself. And they have to request off those days that they need off. Have it be their dog's birthday is the day they take off every year to their own kid's birthday. But if you can schedule nurses right, you will retain your nurses. Thank you. Any other questions? If I may, you touched on pay. Yes. How big of a difference is that? You were, you were talking about the difference between agency, what they pay, and then what the hospital pays or facility pays. Is, is, is that a reason you consistently hear from nurses who work in hospitals about pay? Mm -hmm. It is. Yeah, I think it, maybe it wasn't before, that now that you have, there's maybe a, a competing force, it's, such yeah. as the agencies coming along. And there's so many opportunities for nurses. It's no longer when I got out of nursing school in 1990, I could work in a clinic, a hospital, or a school. Well, now within the hospital, I can tell you when you look at just my nurse recruiter job, but you also have case managers, you have nurses behind the scenes that help with coding and billing, so you can assure that your hospital is bringing all the income and revenue they possibly can. Okay, all right. Thank you. Senator Hart. I'll ask the same question I asked earlier. Um, do you have a sense in terms of how many graduates we have per year in nursing that we're doing here inside the state. I'm trying to get a grasp as to how big the problem is for us to fix. I understand the number of 5,400. What I don't know is how much we're gaining on it. You know, I I could sure get back to you because I've been working with all the nursing schools to recruit to Mary Landing. <coughs> and, you know, the average school has anywhere from 30 to 50 graduates. Okay. This year, we're calling it the year of COVID. So what we typically have is 50 nursing students that come to us from UNMC, 50 nursing students that come from Central Community College, and about 20 nursing students that come to Creighton from Creighton University. So when you look at those this year, UNMC and CCC are both down in the 30 ranges for nurses that will graduate. So, so we we'll caught up in 50 years is what you're suggesting? Well, for... I sure hope so. Nice. You know, <laughs> I have total faith in you guys, and I also have faith in the nursing profession. We're also going to have to figure out how to grow some more skill sets. So maybe it's not looking at everybody having an RN at the bedside versus having an RN that takes four patients. Maybe they take six or seven patients, but they have an aide that's partnered with them. Or maybe they have an LPN that's partnered with them. So just looking at different options to try to make sure we're attending to our patients' needs. In the rural communities, isn't that happening already? We're there, just are, a... there are fewer RNs, and we basically have... CNAs and LPNs and a lot more of those folks as it is. We've been looking at team nursing at Mary Lanning and we started practicing where you put together an RN, LPN, and A together so that you can take a larger patient load but yet still give them the same intention, individual attention that you were giving them before. But yes, you're correct. Thanks. All right. Any other questions from the committee? Seeing none, thank you. Okay, thanks. We'll take our next test fire and support. Hello.
Chair Hansen and members of the Health and Human Services Committee, my name is Todd Stubendeck, that's T-O-D-D-S-T-U-B-B-E-N-D-I-E-C-K, and I'm the State Director of AARP Nebraska. Uh, let me start off by saying how intimidated I am following all these amazing nurse leaders that have come before me, uh, but my, I'm going to share my perspective uh, from the needs uh, of people 50 and older when it comes to nursing. Our nation faces pressing health care challenges, an aging and more diverse population, more people with more chronic conditions, rising costs, and a shortage of providers. According to the American Association of College of Nursing, there is a national shortage of nursing in the United States, as some people have alluded to. In fact, they indicate that nationally by 2025, there'll be a deficit of 130,000 nurses. This shortage has been worsened by the rates of retirement, considering that more than half of the nursing workforce is already over the age of 50. And while the nursing shortage certainly existed before COVID, the stress, workload requirements, and demands of the pandemic have undoubtedly exacerbated the problem. This comes at a time when the aging population of the United States continues to grow and their need for health care grows. There is more demand for nursing services across the country to meet the needs of older adults that suffer from multiple chronic conditions. That demand is only going to continue to grow as by 2030, one in every five Americans will be over the age of 65. Compounding the problem is the fact that nursing schools across the country are struggling to expand capacity to meet the rising demand for care. AARP Nebraska supports LB 503, the Rural Nebraska Nursing Workforce Act, because we believe the nursing scholarship incentives within the bill will be an important tool to attract more young people into the field of nursing. In addition, the bill provides funding for the expansion of approved clinical and learning environments to increase the capacity to train nursing students. Nurses are at the center of a continuum of healthcare. From the moment we were born, they're with us in the hospital. They're a part of our schools and many of our workplaces. Throughout our lives, they provide us care at clinics, doctor's offices, and hospitals. They are with us providing us care as we age in nursing homes. They are an essential part of our lives, and a healthcare system with a nursing shortage cannot deliver the quality of care that we need. ARP Nebraska believes LB 503 can be a part of the innovative solutions that we need to address the nursing shortage. I thank Senator Aguilar for introducing the bill and for his support of nursing and his commitment to protecting the health of all Nebraskans. AARP Nebraska encourages the committee to uh, support LB 503. Thank you. Thank you for coming to testify. Are there any questions from the committee? Seeing none, thank you. Thank you. Take our next test fire in support. Chairman Hansen, members of the Health and Human Services Committee. My name is Paul Turman. That's spelled P-A-U-L-T-U-R-M-A-N. I'm the Chancellor of the Nebraska State College System. I'm here to support uh, LB 503 as proposed by uh, Senator Aguiar, as well as the amendment that he referenced earlier as well. And I'll have the opportunity, hopefully, to answer some of the questions that have surfaced so far. The state colleges really do have a strong history of a partnership for serving workforce needs here in the state. Um, just recently, Wayne State College has joined a partnership with uh, Creighton University to expand and, and be uh, integrated into the accelerated nursing program that they have. Uh, just a year ago, or a little less than a year ago, I joined leadership um, from both of those institutions in the signing of that agreement. And what it does is it provides students the opportunity to start at Wayne, finish their first three years, and then eventually transition to Grand Island, which is in the service region of, of Wayne State. And so over time, I think we look at how is it to continue to make students uh, access and affordability uh, one of the key drivers that the state college is, is working toward. And partnering with an institution like Creighton creates um, ongoing opportunities for those students. Questions earlier about the total number of resident students that maybe Creighton serves um, would be a total of about 80% of their non-residents, but partnering with an institution like Wayne uh, represents 85% of students that come from Nebraska who go to that institution and then transition into that program. We also have a very strong history of a long history of partnerships related to healthcare um, integration here in the state as well. Um, going back to 1989, Shattered State uh, College uh, began to do a partnership with UNMC. Um, and to your point, Senator Hardin, if that's any farther west uh, in Nebraska, I don't know that I want to travel much farther than that um, in the times that I make that trip out there. Um, they put together a partnership for both nursing and medicine whereby 12 students um, were interviewed in their senior year of high school and given slots at UNMC, uh, whereby if they completed their program at Shadron, 
they then would be automatically admitted into uh, the nursing and medicine programs at UNMC once they have graduated. The, that program in and of itself, what has now become the Rural Health Opportunity Program or RHOP, has been expanded now into um, each of our other two institutions. Wayne and Peru both have RHOP programs. Um, and over time, that program has gone on to continue to serve a very large number of students who want to stay in rural areas of the, of the state, want to stay close to home, can work and begin their degree programs, and then ultimately transition to UNMC and then ultimately back uh, into those rural communities. As that program has grown over time, we saw something that started with just 12 students that now has integrated into more than 200 students uh, at any given point in the pipeline at one of our three institutions, and then having about 85 students somewhere in the pipeline um, at UNMC finishing their degrees. Um, started with those two and it now has expanded into 11 different programs, physical therapy, occupational therapy, uh, dentistry, dental hygiene, the wide spectrum that UNMC provides and, and offers. And our goal is to continue to work with Chancellor Gold and UNMC to, to expand those programs. The cost though has been that the institutions have been asked to cover um, the tuition waivers that are granted to those students uh, in addition to the slots that UNMC provides. And that has grown to roughly about $1.6 million a year for our three institutions to help uh, meet those ongoing workforce uh, healthcare needs that the state has. And so the amendment that Senator Aguiar has uh, graciously uh, integrated into the bill um, seeks to provide uh, funding for the next sets of cohorts that we would enter to, into the program uh, next academic year and the year after um, to help cover half of the cost of the uh, tuition waivers that we currently provide. So I would ask that you would support uh, LB 503 as well as the amendment that uh, Senator Aguiar has put in front of you. Um, it certainly serves our capacity to continue to, to bring uh, access and affordability to the rural areas of the state. Um, as well as making sure that we're meeting those workforce uh, needs in the healthcare area across the 11 programs that we serve. I'd be happy to answer any questions that the community might have. Thank you for your testimony. Are there questions from the committee? Senator Harden. Are we in some way, shape or form expecting other students to bear the cost of expanding the healthcare workforce? Uh, Senator, I think in, in its current form, what we're, we're seeing that happen. Um, that right now we tuition waivers, if you understand what those are, it's just we, we provide um, scholarships in lieu of not charging students tuition. And so to provide tuition waivers means that we have to spread that cost of, of maintaining the institution across to other students and families. And so I think in the way in which our hop has grown and expanded from an initial cost of about $28,000 in its first year to 1.6. Um, every time we have a tuition increase, we have to increase that um, on top of what we normally would have simply because we give tuition waivers for an RHOP program. So we're looking to see, can the state provide um, a portion of that cost so we don't have to continue to shift those expenses to students? So do we have students in the West paying an inordinate amount so that we're benefiting students in the East? Is that what I'm hearing you say? I would say, uh, Senator, we have a very good history of students who finish in the RHOP program, um, who go to Omaha and then return back to the rural communities. So right now, 71 counties have students um, who have gone through the RHOP program. Um, we've had 652 students who have completed that since 1989, of which 60% had stayed in the state of Nebraska. And 85% uh, of them are in rural areas of the state. So I think the program is it's meeting its need um, to serve all regions of the state, especially the places where our three institutions are. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? I have one uh, question. So a student who's in the RHOP program, uh, financially, do they cost you more money? Like do you lose money off an RHOP student? I would say, Senator, in the capacity for our institutions to be able to use those remission dollars for other students, um, that would be the inherent cost that we have. Um, right now, I do not allow the institutions or it's our board policy that they can't spend more than 22% of their overall tuition that they collect um, cannot be given to remission programs. And about 20% of their total pool of remissions goes toward RHOP. Um, but overall, 
Um, it, it, we bring in fantastic students that we enjoy the capacity to be able to teach and retain in the area and then feed them back into the rural communities that they come from. Um, it, but the cost continues to grow at levels that are probably not sustainable for our institution without scaling back um, or certainly not agreeing to take on other partnerships um, with UNMC that we desperately need um, to, to meet the needs of the state. Okay. The RHOP program sounds like a good program from what I understand. So as you're getting people involved and students involved that maybe not would have done it to healthcare at the beginning. So when I asked that, I'm kind of curious. So now you're getting more students, but if you're losing money off our hop student, it makes sense why you may want to scale it back or you, there's only so many you can take. So that's, that's one of the reasons I was asking. I'm just trying to figure out the logistics of, you know, how it works with you. So yeah, that's how it works. Okay. Thanks, uh, any other questions from the committee? Right. Seeing that, thank you. Thank you, Senator. Is there anybody else wishing to testify in support of LB503? All right. Is there anybody who wishes to testify in opposition to LB 503? Is there anybody who wishes to testify in a neutral capacity? Hello, Chairman Hanson and members of the HHS committee. Again, my name is Courtney Wittstrup. That's C-O-U-R-T-N-E-Y. W-I-T-T-S-T-R-U-C-K, and I'm the Executive Director of the Nebraska Community College Association. Nice to see you all again. Um, so I'm here to testify on behalf of my member colleges um, in the neutral position for LB 503. And my member colleges, they avidly support any and all efforts to address the nursing shortage in Nebraska. I'm testifying in the neutral position today, though, because as LB 503 is drafted right now, only students in accelerated Bachelor of Science nursing programs would be eligible. Uh, community college nursing students would be excluded as it is currently written. Um, and I heard several other folks testify here. Um, I know uh, Creighton Provost Wilson happened to mention that you know no one institution type can solve this problem. And I think it's such a big problem that makes sense. So the more the merrier, the more people that can be Put, at, put towards this problem, um, I think the sooner we get it solved. Uh, to, make in the, to make a dent in the current uh, and projected nursing shortage, Nebraska really needs an all hands on deck approach. Uh, community colleges would welcome the opportunity to be part of the solution by having our nursing students included in this bill. And we would be happy to work with Senator Aguilar and the committee on any amendments if so desired. Thank you for your time today. Thank you. Are there any questions from the committee? Seeing none, thank you very much. Any bells wish to testify in the neutral capacity? Welcome. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chairman Hansen and members of the Health and Human Services Committee. My name is Dr. Kelsey Anderson, spelled K-E-L-S-I-A-N-D-E-R-S-O-N. I am the provost of Bryan College of Health Sciences and have served in academic leadership for over 10 years. Um, I come to you today on behalf of Bryan College of Health Sciences, the students we proudly serve, and the Nebraskans that they will take care of for years to come in the future, to testify on a neutral capacity for LB 503. Bryan College of Health Sciences has two locations for our nursing program, one in Lincoln and one in Hastings, Nebraska. Bryan Health System has hospitals in Crete, Grand Island, Kearney, Central City, and Lincoln. Workforce, especially rural workforce, is a top priority for our college and health system. We are proud of the fact that over 90% of Bryan College of Health Sciences nursing graduates stay in the state of Nebraska. We all know and have heard today there is a nursing workforce shortage currently in Nebraska and continuing into the future. This shortage extends to many states in our country. LB 503 is a piece of allevi alleviating workforce pressures in our state. And we believe that LB 503 could be made better by inserting language into the bill to ensure that graduates who are receiving educational funding through this bill work in rural Nebraska. As we read the bill now, there is nothing that keeps a scholarship recipient in rural Nebraska. We have had several conversations with Senator Aguilar's office regarding our desire to ensure LB 503 accomplishes its intent to get more nurses in rural Nebraska. To do that, we would request that the committee add language in section five of the bill 
to require that upon graduation, students utilizing the scholarship money be required to work for three years in a county with a population of less than 100,000. With this language, graduates would be required to work for a period outside of Lancaster, Douglas, or Sarpy County in places like Scotts Bluff, North Fork, North Platte, or other rural Nebraska areas. Thank you for your time this afternoon. I ask that you include this additional language in LB 503 before advancing it to committee. I would welcome any questions that you have at this time. Thank you. Are there any questions from the committee? Senator Hart. Thank you. You're welcome. That's a good question. That's great. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Easy. <laughs> All right. Uh, seeing no other questions, uh, thank you for coming. Thank you. Is there anybody else wishing to testify in the neutral capacity? Thank you very much. Again, uh, it's a pleasure to be up here. Uh, Chair, Chairman Hansen and members of the Health and Human Services Committee. My name is Lindsay Snipes, L-I-N-D-S-A-Y-S-N-I-P-E-S. -S -S. And again, my position at Nebraska Methodist College is Vice President of Institutional Effectiveness, and we are located in Omaha, Nebraska. Um, I would going to kind of cut down to uh, pieces of the bill that we feel like this is a good bill. We feel like supporting nursing um, students and workforce in Nebraska is important. Uh, but would like to see some of the language more broader and clearer. Uh, two sections in particular, one on section three, one on page two, approved clinical and learning environment means a clinical and learning environment for the education of nurses at a university and hospital system with multiple state locations it is unclear in April may limit participation under the proposed act. Uh, for example, uh, Nebraska Methodist College is a higher education institution, but not university in name. NMC is affiliated with a health system that has multiple hospital and clinical clinic locations in the state and also has uh, many clinical partnerships for the purpose of delivering that clinical education with other hospitals and clinics across the state that are not affiliated with a university or have multiple state locations. It is unclear what is meant by limiting approved clinical and learning environments to a university and hospital system with multiple state locations. Uh, further, the language under 3.2 on page 2, uh, in quotes, where priority admission is offered uh, to a partnering dual degree program with public or private post-secondary institutions offering a 3 plus 1 degree completion opportunity may limit participation under the proposed act if the institution with an otherwise qualified nurse accelerated nursing program is considered ineligible if it does not have partnerships with other post-secondary institutions offering a three plus one degree completion. Um, again, NMC has a well-established 12-month uh, accelerated nursing program culminating in a BSN. Our past three years of enrollment is 60 students per cohort with a 90% retention rate and 100% institution, institutional persistence rate. Our first time NCLEX pass rates average 93% over the past 10 years. Um, our nursing cohorts in our accelerated programs have the capacity for growth. And in closing, uh, again, Nebraska has a significant shortage of nurses and LB 503 is an important bill towards those attracting, educating future nurses and growing Nebraska's nursing workforce. However, I would ask uh, for the language to be reviewed and for the committee to remove restrictive language uh, to allow other health colleges like Nebraska Methodist College and ex Accelerated Nursing Program students to participate. Thank you again for your time. I won't take any questions. Thank you. Are there any questions from the committee? Seeing none. Thank you so much. Off the hook. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Anybody else wishing to test by the neutral capacity? All right. Seeing none, uh, Senator, Senator Aguilar waves closing. Uh, but before we end that hearing, we did have, for the record, three letters in support of LB 503. So with that, that will end the hearing on LB 503. And we'll move on to LB 463. Can't take over? Careful. 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 Okay. Keep us a shoulder. 
always got to do with performance and all this. Okay. Welcome. We're called the Health and Human Services Committee. All right. Thank you, Vice Chair Harden. Uh, my name is Ben Hansen. That's B-E-N-H-A-N-S-E-N. -E and this is the HHS committee bill, or sometimes we call the Shell Bill. You might be familiar with this since we introduced something very similar last year that Senator Arch did with LB 328. And so this is a bill that uh, we can use in case the need should arise that we might have to amend it or use it for some committee um, concern that might arise in the next year or two. So with that, that's all I have. Any questions? Yes, I have questions. Oh, Why did you take it from two of its members to a member? We wanted to cut some of the rules and regulations, the red tape, so we can make it easier for people to do their jobs. Thank you. And hopefully save the, uh, the taxpayer money. Fantastic. Thank you. Any other questions? Seeing none. I will waive closing. Wonderful. Are there any proponents of LB 463? Seeing none, are there any opponents of LB 463? <laughs> Thank you, Senator Kavanaugh. <laughs> Seeing none, any in the neutral for 463? I guess we have waived the closing, so thank you. No letters. Do we have any letters? We're closing for LB 463. All right, good. And then that will now open the hearing for LB 714. Welcome, Senator John Kavanaugh. Thank you. HHS. Thank you, Chairman Hanson. This is my first time in the HHS committee. Ooh. Ever. Ever. First time in HHS. Well, welcome. Uh, thank you. Good afternoon, Chairman Hanson, members of the Health and Human Services Committee. I'm Senator John Kavanaugh, J-O-H-N-C-A-V-A-N-A-U-G-H, -A -A and I represent the 9th Legislative District in Midtown Omaha. I'm here today to introduce LB 714, which would address the problems of insufficient affordable housing through a one-time investment in the Nebraska Affordable Housing Trust Fund, paired with technical changes that to allow the funds to flow more efficiently and spur creation of more affordable housing across Nebraska. Actually, I should have done this at the beginning, but I have an amendment here. Let's see. It's the room. Uh, I'm distributing a white copy amendment of the bill. It's AM 352. Uh, I'll speak about the amendment. Uh, the truth is that the bill continues to be a work in progress and we need to continue to have a discussion with the current users of the Affordable Housing Trust Fund. I look forward to that opportunity. That being said, housing affordability is a critically important issue in Nebraska, and I'm glad to have this opportunity to put it on this committee's agenda today. LB 714 is one of about 20 housing-related bills introduced this session, and so it's an important discussion for us to have. I think we all agree that the success of our state depends on solving the housing crisis we're currently experiencing. Rapidly increasing home sales and rental prices and issues with quality and quantity of available housing inventory have become a barrier to job growth, community development, talent attraction and retention, overall all quality of life in Nebraska's communities. I believe that one of the best ways to address this problem is to expand one of Nebraska's most successful and longest running affordable housing vehicles. Created in 1996, the Nebraska Affordable Housing Trust Fund helps communities create affordable housing in our state by providing grants for the development of safe, decent, and affordable housing. Since its inception, the Trust Fund has helped communities across Nebraska build more than 6,500 affordable units. The funds impact every community in our state. The statute requires that at least 30% of the trust fund dollars are directed to each of Nebraska's three congressional districts. The Affordable Housing Trust Fund is funded by a portion of the proceeds from a small tax on real estate transactions. In 2022, the fund received an allocation of $12,750,000 from these taxes. These funds are distributed to government and nonprofit organizations, entities to support the construction, acquisition, or rehabilitation of affordable housing units. These eligible applicants may partner with for-profit developers, but for-profits are not currently eligible to apply directly to the trust fund grants. LB 714 states legislative intent to allocate $50 million 
in new one-time funding from the general fund or cash reserve to double the trust fund's capacity for the next buy-in. 714 also contains several policy changes to make it more flexible and reflect reflective of today's housing landscape. Failure to take significant steps towards solving Nebraska's housing crisis would result in the loss of people who call call it home. Young Nebraskans looking to purchase their first homes will move to other states. Businesses won't locate or expand our cities. Veterans, people with disabilities, older adults, essential workers, low wage single parents, and those experiencing extreme poverty will face increased severe long-term consequences. Our growth our grown children will be unable to return home to raise their own families. However, we're confident the housing bills currently being heard in the session will make considerable strides towards creating more vibrant and economically thriving communities. The Nebraska Affordable Housing Trust Fund is one of several proven statewide housing funding vehicles that we should continue to invest in. I look forward to continuing to work with stakeholders to identify the best path forward for the Nebraska Affordable Housing Trust Fund. Thank you for your time. I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you for that. We'll, I know. Try, we'll try to make your first your first uh, bill in HHS as smooth as we can. Okay. Just make sure you tell your sister that. I'm usually pretty hard on it. Are there any questions from the committee? Senator Reby? Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Senator, for being here. Uh, you, you talked about a small tax on the real estate. Is it, do you have any a number on that, or is it a percentage of the Total acquisition cost. Or? Yeah, that's uh, so. My so this bill doesn't change that tax at all. Um, but and it's yeah, this is a funny committee to have a conversation about it. the the doc stamp fee. I think is what it's called. Uh, and I actually don't know what the dollar amount on that is. I, and maybe somebody who's going to come after me might know the answer to that question. That'll probably be the like Snoopy's ears go up when he gets in trouble. That'll probably be what makes the real estate people say. Well, we're not changing that fee. If we were changing it, I, you'd have this room would probably be full. Oh. <laughs> but if we were, but since we're not changing the fee, I, you can see they they reflected in terms of the amount of interest from the real estate community. Okay, thank you, thank you, Jim. Yeah, yeah. Senator Hart, um, how does someone access these funds? I mean, in order to get some help to get going, how does that yeah. actually work? Uh, well, again, somebody behind me might be better to answer that. But yeah, so right now it's for nonprofits uh, and government agencies, I think, can get it through a grant-based process. And so what this bill does is we're going to put some more money into the available fund and then would make it available to uh, newer and emerging uh, developers. So folks who are basically just starting out in the development industry to kind of spur uh, more people to get into the industry of building houses. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> Senator Reapy? And um, uh, is there any way to get communities, businesses, and I think of North Flat, Union Pacific, big, uh, big, biggest thing in town, to get some for doing affordable housing, to get them to do some match money so that we can make our dollars with twice as far, maybe. Um, uh, you know, I think that that's certainly a good thought, and I would imagine that there are programs like that. I guess, what do you call it? The old company town sort of idea. What you're talking about is to have the company invest in it. Uh, that's it. And I, I don't know if that this bill would be positioned to capture that, but maybe one of the folks behind me might be able to answer that as well. I suppose some of these towns are the biggest business in town is Bud's Bar. But yeah. okay, thank you. Senator Michaela Kavanaugh. Thank you, Chairman Hansen. Um, Senator John Kavanaugh, what I'm hearing from Senator Murphy is an offer to help raise money from some private companies to create such a public-private partnership. I've been hung off on before. <laughs> <laughs> um, I just also would like to express my disappointment that this family reunion is just the two of us when it comes to uh, affordable housing. We could have had this whole room filled with Kavanaugh's to testify in various capacities. I don't think the rest of my colleagues today are as disappointed. They're probably tired of hearing Kavanaugh's talk today. I'm aware <laughs> that this is the last hearing before the weekend. Yeah. Thank um, you. Yes, I, I have, a, I think, a couple of questions. Is there anything in here that stipulates that the you give priority to for-profit entities that do not work in conjunction with other organizations? Uh, is there anything that says they have to be in Nebraska? 
Uh, you know, th I think there is probably room for tightening up the definition of who's eligible. But yeah, I, I think you're right. It doesn't specify that they'd be a Nebraska-based company. Uh, and it also doesn't put a top-end size limit on it, which is something I thought about after the fact as well. Yep. I was going to ask that too. Um, also, uh, I'm trying to get the other one I had. Um, with the definition of low income and very low low income families that's in here, what, where do you think most of this money would go to then? Well, I think right now it's going to, well, it's meant to be low. Like which area of Nebraska? Sorry, oh, I should probably oh. say that. Well, so it, currently it has to be split up 30% by each congressional district. So, I mean, realistically, that leaves a 10% swing, and my guess would be the bulk of the 10% is going to the second congressional district when it does come out. Okay, because I know some places just may not be eligible, so they won't spend on anything. Yeah, I, I, I do know that some rural communities have had trouble capturing some of the, that funds, uh, and perhaps allowing for other entities to capture it, which is what this bill does, would allow for some of the rural communities to have another mechanism to actually be able to do that. Okay. And one other one other question. Why why are we hearing this bill? That's a great question. <laughs> uh, so now, what I was yeah. the DED yeah, so what I was told is that this fund, uh, the Affordable Housing Trust Fund, was created by this committee when Don Wesley was the chair of HHS. And so it was his idea. He brought it to his own committee. And if the bills referenced about this have just always gone to HHS. I, it doesn't seem like the right subject matter for HHS, but it's uh, that's why it's here is what I'm told. Well, if you're hearing last long, last less than 20 minutes, I think now. I'm fine with it. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, all right. Thank you. You'll be here to close. Uh, you know, I got to pop over to appropriations and see if they've done my bill without me yet, but I'll come back if I can. All right, that's all right. Okay, so with that, we'll take our first testifier in support of LB 714. Good Welcome. afternoon. Uh, good morning, Chairman Hansen and members of the Health and Human Services Committee. My name is Bree Full, B R I F U L L, and I am here on behalf of Spark CDI, a nonprofit based in Omaha, Nebraska, that works towards holistic community development efforts in North and South Omaha. Spark enthusiastically supports LB 714 as affordable housing development, and the lack thereof is one of the state's most pressing current issues. It's plain and, straightfor and straightforward. Nebraskans have difficulty finding affordable housing options in their desired places to live. If the legislature does not take swift action to address this issue, we can bet that our economy will stagnate and that people will have no choice but to move away to better opportunities in other states. The 2022 Strategic Housing Framework, a recent report signed off by both Governor Ricketts and <coughs> Governor Pillen, offers a snapshot of the state of housing in Nebraska. Key findings include 44% of Nebraska households making less than $75,000 a year pay more than a third of their income on housing. These housing burden families are left with less for other necessities and are less able to contribute to the economy and build personal wealth. Rising housing costs are due in part to housing inventory that has not kept pace with population growth, and new construction has continued to increase since 2009, but has yet to reach pre-2006 levels, resulting in a continuing tight supply of housing. The Nebraska Affordable Housing Trust Fund is a proven and valuable tool for helping communities create affordable housing across Nebraska. Since 1996, the trust fund has helped build more than 6,500 affordable units. As a nonprofit lender, Spark sees great value in being able to provide funding to both for profit and nonprofit developers and support the uh, participation of both types of developers in the affordable housing ecosystem. Because most of the affordable housing is actually built by for profit developers, we are pleased to be able to offer low interest loans to incentivize more of them to consider building beyond the traditional market rate approach. The ability for for profit developers to obtain grants through the Affordable Housing Trust Fund would be another attractive incentive that would rapidly increase capacity at a time when we are in desperate need of more affordable housing statewide. We also appreciate the intent of this bill to give priority among for profit applicants to small and emerging developers to promote entrepreneurs looking uh, to develop affordable housing and to diversify the developer pipeline. Um, 
Spark shares this value. We also strongly support its goals of increasing affordable housing in high need neighborhoods. And as a nonprofit lender, we look forward to continuing to partner with the state to compete uh, to complete more affordable housing developments. Together, we can support Nebraska's competitive competitiveness, community well-being, economic opportunity, and our collective ability to enjoy the good life. Uh, additionally, this bill is part of a master plan. Uh, Senator Reapy, I remember you uh, talking about in the previous bills that you would like to see a master plan, and this is part of that master plan for housing. Uh, there have been five bills that we have put into a package uh, across four committees. Uh, so a lot of senators are gonna be hearing about housing uh, and how important it is this session. Um, this whole package targets both rural and urban as to not favor one over the other because the whole state has a very high need uh, for affordable housing. Um, I will send a copy of the matrix or the table uh, that uh, has all the bill numbers and how they work uh, in conjunction together to your email. And to answer some of your questions, I think it was uh, Senator Reapy again, the match requirement, there is no match requirement for this program, the Nebraska Affordable Housing uh, Trust Fund, but the other housing programs that are going to be in the package, such as uh, the Middle Income Workforce Housing Fund and the Rural Workforce Housing Fund, they do require match uh, matches to utilize the funds. And we have, uh, you know, as a recipient of Middle Income Workforce Housing Funds, we are uh, partnering with uh, actually the Nebraska Hospital Association uh, to uh, increase workforce housing for them. So uh, that's just one example, but businesses are always being utilized for uh, matches. Um, and uh, to answer your question, uh, Senator Hansen, there is, if you look on page uh, six, it says um, the small and emerging business has to be located uh, in the state. Um, it doesn't say that a entrepreneur needs to, but uh, the small and emerging business does have to be located in the state. And that's all I got for you. I'm happy to answer any questions. Okay. Thank you for your testimony. Yep. Are there any questions from the committee? Okay, I'm still trying to find that, what you were talking about. Um, page, page six. Six, uh, line 13. The white copy. Subsection 4.8. Copy. Oh, are you looking at the white copy? It's not. It's not. Okay, that might be why. No, I'm looking at the original bill. Oh. <laughs> Sorry. I'm going to make sure I don't miss what you're saying here. Sure. So, line 13, small and working business needs any person for a person. Okay, I don't see it on here. Um, um, located in the state. On, I must be missing something. Between lines 14 and 15. Yes. Located in, located in the state with employees. Okay, gotcha. There we go. Yeah. So Sorry. On 14, 15. Okay. Yeah, I think I was, I was referring to um, on page five, line 22, who they're going to give first priority to for profit entities that do not work in conjunction with eligible uh, organizations. I thought there might be a way they could say for profit entities that are located in Nebraska. The people who, you know. Oh, okay. I see. That's what, what I was saying. kind of referring to. I yeah, see what you're yeah. saying. Okay. But, yeah, so, so we can actually get kind of both. Sure. I mean, the people are going to be doing the work come from Nebraska. <clears throat> sure. I, I, I'm not sure if any outside uh, organization has actually ever applied for the Nebraska Affordable Housing Trust Fund okay. uh, outside of the state, um, and so I'm not sure that's. Um, yeah. Okay. I don't think that's ever been a, a thing. That's good. You never know who applies once you start putting a lot more money into it. <laughs> <I know. laughs> all of a sudden, people come from all over. So. I know. All right. Well, good. Well, thank you for your testimony. And seeing no other questions from the committee. All right. Thank right? you. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Is there anybody else who's testified in support of LB seven fourteen? Yes. Welcome. Good afternoon, Chamber, or Chairman Hanson, and members of the Health and Human Services Committee. My name is Evan Clark, E-V-A-N-C-L-A-R-K. I am a development associate at Hoppy Development. We are a statewide for-profit developer that focuses on workforce and affordable housing throughout the state of Nebraska. I'm here today as a proponent of this bill, specifically the $50 million allocation and the for-profit eligibility. 
one of my main roles is to create and develop housing projects utilizing the Nebraska Affordable Housing Trust Fund. We previously have partnered with nonprofits for the current trust fund projects. We are, and we are also in the process of partnering with additional nonprofits for funding and housing projects during this year's trust fund cycle. While these partnerships and organizations are great and very beneficial, they can be a barrier. Opening the funding directly to for profits would create a new avenue and reduce these barriers. In most partnerships, we are the lead role responsible for developing projects, completing applications, implementing and delivering the projects, and completing the reporting requirements. This can be timely, costly, and difficult to complete during these partnerships. Approving this bill would open up the funding and remove the middleman and streamline the process to help spur more affordable housing in Nebraska. By directly being able to apply for funding, we can greatly leverage the funding by developing projects at scale. This can reduce costs, which will end up benefiting the tenants and home buyers. Also by leveraging these funds, we can create larger projects with more units, which will require less subsidy per unit and increase the efficiency of the funds. The additional 50 million will also be very beneficial. While I don't have a, the exact numbers, the 2022 trust fund cycle awarded roughly 30 projects with about 15 to $17 million. An additional 50 million could award anywhere from 50 to an additional 100 projects. Many communities have not been able to use this funding due to capacity issues, which is one of the reasons we partner with these organizations. The Nebraska Street Strategic Housing Council um, states that Nebraska's competitiveness and economic future hinges on solving the housing crisis. Some of their goals are reducing the cost burden households by 44,000 and by 2028, developing and rehabilitating 35,000 affordable and attainable low to middle income rental and home ownership units. These goals will require more funding and projects and the efficiency of the funding use. If for profits are able to apply directly for these funds, this will be beneficial. Thank you. If you have any questions, please let me know. Thank you. Are there any questions from the committee? Senator Kavanaugh. I just wanted to say that even though she's not here today, your state senator says to tell you hello. I was disappointed that Senator, senator Waltz wasn't here. <laughs> any other questions from the committee? Senator Ballard. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And you may not know the answer to this, but on the fiscal notice says that the 50 million will be distributed approximately 10%, 27.5%, 40%, and 22.5%. Do you know why that is? Why isn't it just... 25, 25, 25. Um, I mean, you may not know, and someone may be behind you. Do you know where it is in the bill? Uh, it's actually on the fiscal note from the oh. department. And if you don't know, don't that is completely I okay. That is okay. Thank you for being here. Mm -hmm. okay. Any other questions? All right. I did want to address one of your questions. Sure. I think it was you that had it. Um, the, the congressional districts, um, typically, uh, the third congressional district is usually the most competitive district. So any funding that's left over, um, the discretionary funds usually goes to that district. Um, so it's very competitive in the third congressional district. A lot of communities that are um, applying for the funding, so they're often the ones that are left out. So another reason why the additional funding would be beneficial. I think we have 85 counties. Yeah. All right. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you. The next test in support of LP 714. Welcome. Good afternoon, Chairperson Hansen and members of the committee. My name is Carol Bodine, C A R O L B O D E E N. I'm the Director of Policy and Outreach for the Nebraska Housing Developers Association. And I'm here today to testify in support of LB 714. The Nebraska Housing Developers Association is an organization with over 70 members from across the state. Our mission is to champion affordable housing. It's our goal that Nebraskans of every income have the cornerstone foundation of a healthy and affordable home. Our members include both nonprofit and for profit developers and organizations. And I love the Nebraska Housing Trust Fund. So um, I'm excited to, uh, to be able to talk about it. Our organization supports the appropriation of 50 million to the Nebraska Affordable Housing Trust Fund to be used to develop housing for low and moderate income families throughout the state. 
The Nebraska Housing Trust Fund has supported development of safe and affordable housing units, resulting in new jobs and millions of dollars of community investment across Nebraska. When I say that our goal as an organization is that every Nebraskan have the cornerstone foundation of a healthy and affordable home, I feel that the Nebraska Housing a Nebraska Affordable Housing Trust Fund is the cornerstone foundation of affordable housing development in Nebraska. Our organization was formed at the time that the Nebraska Affordable Housing Trust Fund came along. We have advocated for the trust fund throughout the years and have seen the accomplishments of this fund. Grants from this trust fund can be used in many ways to facilitate affordable housing, new construction, rehabilitation, weatherization, accessibility, down payment assistance, demolition of vacant and condemned buildings, home buyer education, and assistance to nonprofit affordable housing developers. Amounts awarded typically result in overall development investment of over three and a half times the granted amount. And that doesn't count the impact on jobs, small businesses, and the building supply stores in these communities. These types of investments make a difference in communities, in neighborhoods, and in the lives of individuals. When I worked as a nonprofit affordable housing developer in North Platte and made use of the trust fund dollars, I saw firsthand the work that could be done. I saw the increase in property taxes generated by the projects that we were involved in. And I also met the people that benefited and saw the appreciation they had for the opportunities that these projects had provided. The only downside was that we couldn't do more. And this additional funding on top of the normal annual allocation from the doc stamp could allow organizations to do more to make a larger impact. With all that said, in speaking on behalf of our members, we do have reservations regarding some of the proposed amendments to the Nebraska Affordable Housing Act. <coughs> it's my understanding that a, an amendment has been proposed that will address concerns that we had related to income guidelines and length of application periods. Our membership is diverse, and while there are some that support allowing for-profit entities to be eligible for these funds, there are also many that oppose that change. Reasons for opposing include unanticipated tax consequences to a for-profit ent entity in receiving grant funds, tax liabilities could result in state funds being used to pay federal taxes, and the Nebraska Affordable Housing Trust Fund has a 26-year history of success helping develop and spur development of affordable housing by granting funds to nonprofit organizations and government entities. This success involves for-profit organizations who are actively involved in this development activity as they work in conjunction with the eligible nonprofit recipient. These nonprofits are the heart and soul, and over time, um, I think there's concern that it may undermine their sustainability in that if uh, going forward, they had to get to a point where they competed against for-profits, it could be more difficult for the nonprofits. And as I said, our membership includes for-profits and nonprofits, and so we have a mix. The bottom line is that we need to continue investing in housing, and I know you keep hearing this, and we are simply still behind the need and the demand that was created after the recession of 2009. And this need is especially high for those families of low and moderate income. I ask that you support this additional funding for the Nebraska Affordable Housing Trust Fund, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. And I probably could answer the question regarding, um, Senator Reeve had a question on the doc stamp that funds the um, the normal allocation to the trust fund. Um, it is two dollars and twenty five cents of every um, of each real estate transfer. And of that amount, fifty cents is retained by the register of deeds for that applicable county. Twenty five cents goes to the Department of Economic Development site and building fund. 95 cents goes to this Nebraska Affordable Housing Trust Fund. And then 25 cents goes to the Homeless Shelter Assistance Trust Fund. And 30 cents goes to Behavioral Health Services Fund. Thank you. Um, and how does someone access the funds, I believe was also asked, yeah. And um, as it was, uh, I think, mentioned a little bit in some of the other testimony, it is a competitive grant process. And for the normal allocation each year, there is a competitive process that occurs usually in the spring. And so um, 
the the application opens up and um, then throughout the state you have that opportunity to apply so um, and based on also uh, related to the uh, matching it's not required that there be matching funds but there are some um, scoring points that go towards your application um, if you do have some matching so um, that is tied in there all right. Any questions from the community or from the committee? I have a couple. You sure. listed off what a lot of this money can be used for. Yeah. Did you say for helping pay for loans? Loans? No. You said down payments on loans. Oh yes. So um, there's a couple of ways that that's used. Um, one, you can actually um, an an organization can apply to provide down payment assistance to home buyers. Um, Often it has been like to a first time home buyer or to a low income home buyer. And what that does is that kind of helps them, it gives them a grant for some funds to um, make that purchase on the home when they don't have 20% to put down. And then a lien, normally then a lien is placed on the property and it's forgivable over a period of time. And so they have to live in that property for a certain number of years in order to not have to pay that money back. Okay. That's one of the ways. So that they keep all done. the money comes back to the state or does the bank keep it? No, it doesn't go to the, it doesn't go to the, the bank. It goes to um, basically a credit to the home buyer. So it's Which funds that, bank, right? well, it's funds on, I guess it's funds on, on behalf of, like say the nonprofit organization would um, grant those funds as a, a credit in the the purchase of the property. So if they default. So what is that money? If they, they default, leave or they just they can't pay it, or they go bankrupt. Um, if they have if they have proceeds from the sale of the like say they sell the house before they um, before the affordability period whatever has not been forgiven on that amount comes back to the nonprofit who granted those funds to them. Okay. And they have to use that again, the money came back to them for the same the, purpose? Yes. Yes. It would go back to the nonprofit to um, use in their program income to facilitate other affordable housing programs. Per the guidelines for the this. guidelines yes know, just putting in their pocket and using it for something else that's not the purpose of this you know? right right and so and, and it's, so they go bankrupt and you said there's a lien on the house right, right. so they go bankrupt they sell the house mm -hmm. it's the same thing that yes. money goes back to the it's a lien yes so if if there are pro now we wouldn't take we wouldn't take money like we wouldn't um encumber them like say they went bank they couldn't make their payment and the house had to be sold in the didn't sell for enough that that money could be paid back then per the guidelines that have been in place in previous programs now that you know that can change from year to year but previously that would not then be like we wouldn't as a nonprofit, we wouldn't say that they have to pay us back if they didn't have any money to pay us back the with. bank has first rights Oh yes, we yeah. The nonprofit would have the the subordinate lien. Okay. So it's not guaranteed we get our money back, or the nonprofit would get their money back. Right. Right. Okay. Right. But what we're trying to do in that program is to help people get into help someone get into a home um, when they may not have a large savings to um, to be able to have that large down payment. So. We can give them a. We could give them a grant that would help them in making that purchase. Okay. All right. Okay. And then another way that that could be used, um, like our organization, we did. Um, we would do construction projects, and we would sell the property to the the um, home buyer, and then we would provide some down payment assistance to them as part of that proper as part of that program so that would be part of the grant funds to help that person be able to get into a home okay. but once again it would have an affordability period 
um, it's not free money. They would have to stay in the home a certain number of time. And uh, in the last time that I worked with this program, it was 10 years. Okay. So. Yeah, so, okay, so they leave after five years. Then whatever has not been forgiven then would come back to the would come back to the nonprofit, the nonprofit not mm -hmm. the state, not right. back to the general. Okay. Right, right. I'm surprised. I thought I would think it would come back to the state, the people who allocated the money instead of going back to the nonprofit. Um, because I think it's because the the funds have been they've been originally granted to the nonprofit to use for affordable housing development. Okay. And so then the nonprofit would then have to continue to use that money toward, um, you know, toward additional programs that would be helping low to moderate income home buyers. Okay, I appreciate you answering my questions because we don't really get a whole lot of affordable housing bills. Exactly. In HHS. <laughs> well, and that's one of the reasons that um, that we were happy that Bree was happy that this uh, was able to come before this committee because it's good. Affordable housing is not a simple. I, when I started, I had worked in banking, I had worked in economic development for Chamber of Commerce and all that. It still took me a good year or two when I started working for the Affordable Housing Development Organization in North Platte to really get a handle on affordable housing development. And there's there's a lot of pieces that go into it. So yeah. I, was on, I was under the illusion that this extra appropriation of funds this program was more to address the, address the housing shortage yes in nebraska yes which means building more homes yes not putting more people into homes right so you know what i mean it's like that's why i'm confused i'm like why would we help people get a loan and that doesn't address the housing shortage well and it's it's possible and and that's where all i have to base off is how the trust fund is how the the traditional amounts that are allocated to the trust fund each year, how those are used and allocated. So I don't know if there would be a different allocation plan for this one time infusion into the trust fund. Okay. So I don't have privy to that and, information. And that's fine. And do you know if, well, last question. Promise. That's okay. Because I'm, I'm always kind of curious to know if we're, used, we're putting money towards a program, how well it's working. Mm -hmm. um, are there like any studies or any statistics or data that show mm -hmm. since this program has been taken over that we have actually, it's done what it's supposed to do? Do you know if there's anything out there? Yes, yes. And we can get that information for you. Yeah, Absolutely. I'd be curious. Yeah. So just yeah. more from a, I'd say investment yeah. standpoint. But yeah, I mean, yeah. No, glad to. I'm, like I said, I'm, I'm always excited to talk about the trust fund and affordable housing, so. I could tell right off the bat you were all excited I know about it, so. I had a lot of fun doing it when I actually when I actually was doing it and getting to build houses and help people to get into them um, you know it's the you really feel like you're making a difference when you're helping people either uh, fix up their home when they can't afford to or when you're helping them get into a first time home that that you know they thought they might not never have an opportunity to do sure. so okay Yep. Any other, oops, just make sure. Any other questions for the committee? All right. Saying none. Thank you for coming. Okay. Appreciate it. Thank you. And we'll get some statistics. To Thank you. you. Appreciate that. Take the next test for our support. <clears throat> Welcome back. Good to be back. Chair Hansen and members of the Health and Human Services Committee. My name is Todd Stubbenbeck, T-O-D-D-S-T-U-B-B-E-N. D-I-E-C-K, and I'm the State Director of AARP Nebraska. So why does AARP Nebraska care about housing? What we know that as people age, what they want most of all is to be able to stay in their homes and communities for as long as possible. In fact, according to AARP Nebraska's 2022 Vital Voices Survey, 84% of Nebraskans aged 45 and older said staying in their homes as they get older is extremely or very important to do to them. To do this, they need a range of housing options that accommodate their needs as they age. This is why AARP strongly supports the creation of diverse, affordable housing to meet the needs of our changing demographics. By 2030, one in every five Americans will be over the age of 65 and will face a shortage of appropriate housing to meet their needs, including homes that are structurally and mechanically safe and accommodate individuals with disabilities. 
The other point, important point to make here is that older Nebraskans have diverse housing options that meet their needs as they age. They are more likely to sell the single family homes where they raise their for children, which will in turn create more housing options for working families and new residents. ARP Nebraska supports LB714 because it will take a number of steps to address our state's affordable housing needs, including allowing for-profit developers to access new funding under the Act and allowing for multiple application periods to ensure appropriated funds are spent. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank Senator John Kavanaugh for introducing LB714 and for his commitment to supporting affordable housing. Happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Are there any questions from the committee? Thank you. Thank you. Take next testify in support of LB714. Uh, seeing none, is there anybody who wishes to testify in opposition to LB714? And seeing none, is there anybody who wishes to testify in neutral to 714? Good afternoon, Welcome. Chair Hansen, distinguished members of the Health and Human Services Committee. My name is Wayne Mortensen, that's W-A-Y-N-E, M-O-R-T-E-N-S-E-N. And I am here today as the Chief Executive Officer of NeighborWorks Lincoln. Uh, NeighborWorks has been a prolific developer of for sale affordable housing since its founding in 1986 and is a high performing grantee of the Housing Trust Fund, which is the subject of today's hearing. Uh, we are fortunate to be a regular grantee uh, and leverage approximately one and a half million dollars in these funds every year uh, to support the construction of at least eight new homes and fund a down payment rehab assistance loan program, which I'm happy to answer any questions that you have on. Combined, our efforts with trust fund uh, dollars help 30 low and middle income Lincoln families achieve their dream of home ownership each year. The trust fund plays a critical role in the continuum of subsidized housing and production across Nebraska. Uh, and it's really critical because it's our money. Uh, it's not passed through federal money. Uh, prioritized on our goals, not the rules or compliance regulations of agencies outside of the state, distributed to our organizations. Nebraska nonprofits committed long term to the array of needs across the state's diverse communities. Our experience with the trust fund compels us to advocate fiercely for expanded resources that can transform um, that can be life-changing uh, transformations to Nebraskans of all backgrounds and to promote caution on any fundamental changes to the program, uh, whereas LB714 does both of those. Uh, and that's why we're here uh, as neutral testifiers. Uh, let me be clear that we're highly supportive of monies allocated from the general fund into the, into the trust fund as those directly translate into home ownership and rental opportunities for Nebraskans everywhere. Uh, we're also supportive of the idea of doing um, secondary application uh, periods and opportunities to get the funds into communities when and where possible. Um, affordable housing is not limited to a particular season and neither should funding, funding be. Um, and uh, that's where um, our support starts to change a little bit into concern with the legislation. Uh, um, the bill on page five eliminates increased homeownership as a prioritized selection criteria. And NeighborWorks is a strong advocate for quality rental housing, but believes also that the first time homeownership um, should remain a, prior, a primary emphasis of the fund itself, uh, as that has been one of its calling cards over its history. Uh, the question of for-profit developer eligibility is a really complicated one uh, because uh, the program works in part because of the motives and track record of its grantees over the years, uh, which have all been nonprofits with track record in the communities they live, expanding affordable housing and increased stability in the communities they serve. Uh, today, when a private developer identifies a project that could benefit from trust fund support, they partner with one of these agencies to achieve their kind of now collectively shared vision uh, for the project. This allows the partners to leverage the funds tax free while ensuring that an experienced nonprofit is administering those resources and doing the necessary work of notifying the community about the opportunity that's coming. To revise the trust fund grant making to prioritize for profits, not working in conjunction with eligible organizations, would compromise this dynamic while also creating a potential tax liability for those for profit groups. Uh, for instance, uh, every million dollars going forward of grant money um, distributed to a for profit developer would then come back to the state in $150,000 to $200,000 in taxes because that has to be declared as revenue to that developer. And so we're using state money to fund state taxes in that situation. 
Not to mention that there are other programs such as the low income housing tax credit program that already benefits uh, developers of uh, those of that scale and of those uh, business models. The uh, final concern that we have is that the appearance of several small and emerging businesses as first time grantees with limited experience in affordable housing would further stress the managerial function of the Nebraska Department of Economic Development staff. Uh, a place that has already been kind of wrecked with the perfect storm of workforce turnover, um, all of their new ARPA responsibilities uh, that we're grateful to have been appropriated from the last legislative cycle and the evolving requirements from the pass-through funders that keep changing the rules uh, for their money. To be sure, Nebraska's housing needs surpass its current development capacity, and so the importance of recruiting and cultivating new housing developers across the state is uh, of critical importance. The Department of Economic Development would also be a perfect venue for this initiative because uh, it would ideally leverage expertise from both the housing and the business development portfolios at DED to create financial tools and technical assistance specifically useful to small and emerging developers in both the for-profit and not-for-profit spaces. Uh, and we would be eager at NeighborWorks to join forces with the DED and our housing partners across the state to create such a program. We just don't believe that program should be the trust fund uh, for, the, for the time being. We appreciate Senator Kavanaugh's commitment to the affordable housing and are really excited about the opportunity to be in dialogue with the Health and Human Services Committee about the critical importance of affordable housing across Nebraska. Happy to answer any questions that you have. Thank you. Are there any questions from the committee? Seeing none. So just to really quickly respond, we of those $1.5 million we get every year, a third of that is for a down payment assistance uh, program that helps uh, working class families afford entry-level housing. Um, those uh, uh, grants range from twenty-five dollars to $35,000. They cover their closing costs, they cover uh, their down payment, and then they fund a twelve dollars to $15,000 rehabilitation scope to get those homes up to maintenance-free condition. So um, it's not necessarily creating new housing, but it is preserving existing affordable housing within the market. And so as a, as a, um, just a general funding priority, it's critically important because otherwise our deficits begin to skyrocket even further. Now I got a question. Yeah. So your neighbor works Lincoln builds homes. Yes. That, for, that are eligible. Like are they, they, they have to be built or, uh, for sale within a certain price range. Mm -hmm. What is that price range? Yeah. Um, so the, we have three different uh, lines of business on our real estate side. We build homes um, that are sold then to uh, families at 80% of the area median income. So that price point has to be at about $180,000. Uh, the rest is subsidized uh, from help with the trust fund and other programs. Uh, we uh, do have a workforce rehab program uh, where we uh, get, do basically gut rehabs of homes. Those have to be sold between one hundred and twenty-five and two hundred seventy-five thousand dollars. And then our DPA program is whatever the home buyer can afford, um, plus that uh, down payment assistance loan I just referenced. Okay, so you're saying I'm building a new home has to be one hundred eighty thousand dollars. That's what we can sell it for. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to think of the difference between a, a nonprofit and a for-profit. Mm -hmm. How cheap they can build a home. There's like no what, what the difference is, or if there is a difference. There's at all. no difference between what we can build a home for versus what Hoppy could build a yeah, home for. I would agree. And so it makes sense, you know, because I know a lot of times for profit businesses don't build homes like this because yeah. they're labor intensive, not labor intensive, right. but it's just the profit margin isn't there as much. Yeah. So, so a lot of so private sure. developers don't do for sale housing because they're uh, committed long term to these programs. So, 10 year affordability yeah. period, for instance, they're on the hook to make sure that that particular house is affordable for 10 years, uh, which is not part of their kind of follow up or business. <coughs> sure, makes sense. All right, thank you. Thank you. Uh, seeing no other questions, thanks for testifying. Anybody else wishing to testify in a neutral capacity? All right. And not seeing Senator Kavanaugh in the room, we will waive his closing. And for the record, we did have four letters in support of LB 714. So that will end the hearing on LB 714 and end our hearings for today.